welcome all of you to the UPSA where we are having this very very great lecture and for some reason God decided to soften the ground for us on Constitution Day and so it's been raining cats and dogs outside for those who are just coming through we notice that uh, and looking from outside we see that it's raining but it is it is showers of blessings as we say all the time when we see rains here and we're really honored and grateful that you've taken time off your schedules it's a holiday. You would have been at the beach chilling or maybe just gone to some nice place and be quiet and just observe. But you decided to come here and listen to a review of the document that binds all of us together. It is the basic law of the Republic of Ghana, which is more than 30 years old. A lot of the times people say, you know what, that book was just created to satisfy one man and that man is no more. Let's do something about it. Others say no. That book is a very powerful tool, but it's being used wrongly by people who uh, use it. Either way, it's a conversation we'll be having here this afternoon. My name is Umaru Sanda Amadou. I'm a journalist with CTFM and City TV. That's my primary job. But I'm also a member of One Ghana Movement. Uh, we are the one who are putting out uh, this particular lecture. This will be the fourth in the series. Last year we were here with Nid Dotti, and it was a beautiful one. And today promises to be a very exciting one as well. And we are happy that we are going to have, I think the whole Ghana, there's only one man who can write on his CV that he can work under pressure and everybody would understand because he works under pressure. I mean, watching the African election, how he was calm in the control room or the, the, the strong room of the Electoral Commission at the time, we couldn't have gotten a better uh, person to speak to us today. Again, an integral part of a democracy for many is the elections that are conducted. And if the election is not transparent, free, and fair, people question that democracy. In fact, a lot of people reduce democracy to elections. And so if you have someone who has been at the helm of affairs of conducting elections in this country and having done it for decades, I think he's the best person we can put together. So I would say, first of all, let's all give a round of applause to our constitution for having survived the longest. Because we've seen constitutions come and go, right? Uh, some survived for just a year or two and they, they booted out. This one is the most resilient, the most successful so far. So we are under the 1992 constitution, which has a preamble saying, we the people. We have actually put that document uh, in our hands and said that this is what we want to guide us and to govern us. So we're going to do a review. It is not an attack, it's a conversation. And if you're not familiar with the structure, this is what we're going to do. Our main lecture is going to happen, which is a review of the of our democracy so far, looking at the Constitution on Constitution Day. And then, of course, we'll do a review of the review. Uh, if you look at the itinerary, we have scheduled to have uh, Justice Emil Schott, uh, former head of the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, to give us the first review. Unfortunately, um, an emergency has come up, and he's not able to join us. He will not be here. But our other two reviewers are here. And because lawyers are about seniority, Justice Emil Schott would have come first. And then the next person um, would come. Uh, he comes from Esikado in the, in the Western region. I'm going to introduce him formally and properly when he's about to do his delivery. Suffice it to say, he has been a Speaker of the House of Parliament um, and also a, currently a Member of Parliament. We'll talk about him. The Honorable uh, Jogate is in our midst. Please give us a wave so we can give you a round of applause. Another former attorney general who is going to do a review for us. And so this is what we did. Um, because we are a very political country, one Ghana movement decided that let's just get people who can do this review. And even if you tag them being political, there could be someone else who counter. So we have NDs and MPP that have been, a, uh, been doing this cyclical thing for us since 1992. So we have an attorney general, the one I've just introduced, Jonobo Jogate being a member of the NPP, having served in the Kufuor government as an attorney general. We also have Madame Marietta Bruce, served as attorney general uh, in the NDC government. Madame, please give us a wave so we can thank you so much. Now, let me acknowledge a few more people who have joined us for the discussion this afternoon. Now, Honorable Dr. K.K. Sapon is the chancellor of UPSA. They are the ones who are hosting us. Please give us a wave so we can celebrate you. Thank you so much. He's supported by the Dean of the UPSA Faculty of Law, Mr. Kofi Abuchi. Give us a wave, sir. Thank you so much. 
Her Excellency Josephine Nkrumah was once chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, NCCE. Now she's ECOWAS ambassador to Liberia. Madam, give us a wave, please. We also have in our midst a former Minister of State, a uh, member of Parliament who replaced the current president in his constituency when he decided to go for a higher office. Incidentally, this member of Parliament is also planning not to contest again. I don't know if he wants to go for higher office. The Honorable Atachi Asamo, please give us a wave, sir. <laughs> Mrs. Ifwagate is in our midst. Madam, please give us a wave. Thank you so much for joining us. We also have Ms. Helga J.M. Bwedi, former CEO of YES, Youth Enterprise Support. It was one of those en um, enterprises that were introduced or youth support programs to deal with youth employment. Madam Helga, please give us a wave. We also have in our midst the vice president or a vice president of Imani Africa, Mr. Kofi Bento. Please give us a wave. He's a lawyer. Thank you so much. And uh, the grandpapa, Dr. Doctor. And you must mention the two doctors, otherwise you're in trouble. If you're a journalist, you know that. Nyaho, nyaho, tamaklo. Onupa, over we salute you, sir. Thank you so much. I, I don't think I need to give him an introduction. We'll do more of the introductions as um, the program proceeds. But let me just say that this is a program being put together, the Constitution Day lecture being put together by One Ghana Movement, the UPSA uh, Law Faculty, with support from CTFM and CityTV being the exclusive media house giving us this coverage. So we are live on CTFM, we are live on CityTV, and we are indeed grateful. To do us the honors of giving us a welcome address on behalf of One Ghana and UPSA, I'm going to invite Dean of the Ghana, uh, the UPSA Law Faculty, Kofi Abuchi, to do that as the honors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Chancellor of UPSA, Dr. K.K. Sapun. Speaker, the Honorable Dr. Farijan, Ministers of State and former Ministers of State, members of Parliament present, members of the Diplomatic Corps present, eminent citizens of our country, many of whom I see here, so pardon me if I don't mention names, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'll just start by saying that when one of the founding fathers of America, Benjamin Franklin, was asked what constitution or what governance system was being framed for America, he answered by saying a republic. And then he quickly added, if you can keep it. The second part of the answer has stood the test of time. People remember that more than the first part, which is if you can keep it. Writing constitutions appear to be the easy part of the problem. The difficult one is the commitment to constitutional rule. The UPSA Law School and One Ghana Movement has for the past four years collaborated to organize this conversation annually around our constitution because we believe in the fact that keeping a constitution is an intentional act. So every year we've reflected on who should our speaker be I'm sure that you will agree that in a country where, the, where everything is politicized, some will argue even common sense itself is politicized. Sometimes we have difficulties looking for who we should call on to speak. Because everyone who comes on our platform, I'm sure there are those who would spend their time trying to evaluate the person's likely political character. This year, we find ourselves in an electoral year in which in December of this year, we're going to elect once again a new government and a new parliament. And so we thought there was no better a speaker than for us to look up to the one who arguably can be described as the architect of Ghana's electoral governance. As was mentioned by our moderator, our speaker today fits and ticks many boxes. Apart from being easily Ghana's, you know, the father of Ghana's electoral governance, he is also an eminent state man who can, be, who can hardly be pigeonholed into a particular political box. I have to share the
the statements or rather the sentiments expressed by the moderator when he indicated that one of his key characteristics is his ability to pretend there is no tension. And honestly, I don't know how he did that too. Because I famously remember 2008, if my memory serves me right, when anyone who was in this country at the time would recall that if Ghana, if there was ever a moment when we could say Ghana came to the brink and possibly tipping over, it must have been 2008. And then any time we saw our electoral commissioner in the process addressing the country and keeping us updated, he spoke as if there was nothing happening. At a point, I wasn't sure whether that should be a moment of excitement, knowing that your leader, by way of your electoral leader, was comfortable, or whether I should be annoyed that he doesn't appreciate the sensitivities of the time. I think one thing is clear. Future, or the future, posterity appears, the benefit of um, hindsight, appears to have um, smiled on him, given the fact that he clearly has demonstrated one thing, that neutrality, bipartisanship, and statesmanship wins the day. So we are delighted today to have a speaker of his eminence, speaker of his standing, speaker of his commitment, and the fact that he is going to speak to us as an audience here, but more importantly as a nation, given the many more who are listening outside of this place. And I'm confident that at the end of it all, by the time the lecture is over today, all of us here will be better benefited and our country will be better advised as we move forward the election, move forward towards the election in December 2024. So I'd like to welcome all of us on behalf of my chancellor and my vice chancellor who's not here. I would like to welcome all of us to the beautiful campus of UPSA, and I do hope that this lecture will benefit our country. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's the dean of the law faculty here at UPSA, Kofi Abochi. Thank you so much. And also a member of the One Ghana uh, movement. Now, we are live on City FM and City TV, also on our social media platforms. And of course, we also have support from other media houses that are giving us this live coverage here. Um, the multimedia group is giving us a coverage. Uh, TV3, that's a media general group, is supporting us. The Despite Media Group also giving us a coverage here. We really are grateful. Now, let me just say that for the team of reporters who are here to support us, if you could kindly move to the left side of the aisle, I'll be, I'll be very grateful. Uh, organizer said to communicate that to you. So, media people who are covering kindly be behind the cameras at this side. Um, very, very grateful for that. Now, this is a Constitution Day lecture, the fourth in the series, as we are doing for you. And today is Reflections on our Democracy, the Constitution, Elections, and the Judiciary. Now, even before we got this Constitution, they had to go through what was called a plebiscite uh, for us to agree and say that this is what we wanted as a document. This particular man who is going to speak to us has been through it all. Uh, having been uh, involved in electoral matters, and I'm sure he may give us, he doesn't want us to talk much about him, but we have to. We all know who he is and how valuable he's been. Born June 18, 1945, somewhere in the Bono region. Uh, Anyimon, that's Anyimon, thank you so much. Uh, he was um, born there. He attended Achimota School and at this school for his A level and also graduated from the University of Ghana in 1967 with BA degree, Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy. He went to attain an MA in African politics in 1969 from the same university. He also studied at the United States where he was awarded a PhD in political science from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Afarijan worked as a lecturer and a professor in political science at the University of Ghana. He has also lectured in the United States and Nigeria. He was a member of the Committee of Experts that drafted the Fourth Republican Constitution for Ghana. So you can call him the father of the Constitution. We're going to hear him comment about his child, whether he's proud of this child after 30 years, whether he thinks there are some things he would have done when he was doing the cooking. We'll be hearing from him today. He was appointed Deputy Chairperson of the Interim National Electoral Commission by the PNDC to usher us into 1992. He retired in 2015, and the rest is history. Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's welcome Dr. Kojo Afarijan. Thank you.
very much. There have been a few um, yes. A few things have been turned upside down, and I'm not going to waste time. You know. um, I went to Adesala first before uh, Achimota, yeah. and that is very important. <laughs> <laughs> that is very important. I'd like to correct that. And uh, my little town, Anyimum, yes, near Jine Jine. You've heard of Jine Jine? Jine Jine is very far away from Techiman. And yet, you hear that little town next to Techiman, when they sing, they say our capital is Jine Jine. Yeah. It is not um, ge geographically correct. Anyway, um, I feel very honored to have been asked to share my reflections on aspects of our Constitution. When I got the invitation, I asked myself, why me? Why does anybody think that my reflections will be interesting or useful. So that was my initial reaction. Then I thought a bit about it, and I decided that I'll take it as an invitation to contribute to a democratic dialogue. And a democratic dialogue is reason based. I want us to note that. And because it's reason based, persons who have contrary views can agree to disagree on reasonable grounds and in mutual respect. In that context, you could say that practically anybody's reflections might be interesting or useful, provided they are reason-based, because they could then stimulate an interesting or a useful discussion. So, moderator, it is quite a long time now since Ghana adopted democracy as the ben uh, benchmark for running its affairs as a nation. If we take the time we became an independent country at the beginning, we have been on the road to democracy for over 60 years now, albeit punctuated by considerable periods of military rule. I think that our own history and the histories of other countries clearly show that this path to democracy is not one of linear progression. So it is useful to view democracy in practice as a work in progress that calls for continual appraisal to see whether we are on the right path. Against that backdrop, my reflections on our democracy are limited in two ways, to the three specified aspects, namely the Constitution, elections, and the judiciary, and to our endeavors in the Fourth Republic only. I will give the reflections in the specified order, beginning with the Constitution. Our current Constitution is a fourth since independence. It has lasted for three decades, nearly half of the entire life of our country as an independent nation, and in fact, longer than the three previous constitutions 
put together thus far. On that basic fact alone, some people say that we have not done badly. In fact, we have done reasonably well by the Fourth Republican Constitution. The fact that it has lasted so long. And they point in particular to the fact that we have succeeded to elect a government peacefully through the ballot box each of the specified uh, periods during the 30 years. But I think that that notwithstanding, there are clear signs of deconsolidation of our democracy. Over the years, we have become poorer as a nation and as a people, due mainly to pervasive corruption, particularly in the public sector, in public life. Unfortunately, some of our key institutions are becoming institutions of dubious integrity. Increasingly, candidates who lose elections are alleging manipulation and refusing to accept the results. By and large, we have not been able to diffuse the principles of democratic behavior widely into our society. And there is a general lack of predictability in social life, which is a disincentive to proper behavior. Some people will say that these are perceived and not real ailments of our democracy. But that doesn't change the picture at all. Because for purposes of trust and confidence in public institutions and public office holders, perception is as important as reality. In any case, in all probability, some of these factors have contributed to the many calls to amend our constitution. I think three things relating to amending the Constitution are worthy of note. First, the amendment process is likely to be a long one because it will require, as a first step, a referendum done on its own or attached to a general election. Secondly, because practically everything that goes awry in our country is somehow often blamed on the Constitution, it will be difficult to amend the Constitution to the satisfaction of the general public. But we must be careful not to unnecessarily tinker with the Constitution. Thirdly, the extent to which amending the Constitution will cure the ailments of our democracy is a moot issue. Although the example of Singapore shows that it is possible to use law to change people's attitudes and behavior. The moderator, in spite of the foregoing caveats, In principle, the calls for, to amend the Constitution are in order. Because a Constitution is not like a Bible whose precepts are held to be unchangeable. If it were so, a Constitution would not contain procedures for making changes to it. In fact, by law, on a regular basis, some countries do 
an appraisal of their constitutional performance over the preceding period with a view to making recommendations for effective pe performance where necessary. This practice may be worth our consideration in changing, in amending our constitution. I'm aware that individuals have made several recommendations for changes to our constitution. And I also know that a body of officially sponsored recommendations for that purpose exists. But I must say that my reflections are without prejudice to any such recommendations. Against that backdrop, my reflections on the Constitution will consist of short statements, and I mean short, short statements, relating to three issues. The separation of powers between the executive and the legislature, the Council of State, and local government. The separation of powers is intended to make it possible for one branch of government to check any excesses of another branch. In my view, with about half of ministers plus some of the de deputy ministers drawn from parliament, the legislature cannot effectively check the executive. Cabinet decisions are binding on ministers and deputy ministers, and they must be defended by them, including in parliament. I think that a system where ministers and their deputies are drawn from outside parliament will be better suited to holding the executive in check. Indeed, the requirement to appoint so many ministers from parliament may be an incentive for a president to increase the number of ministers in order to minimize potential trouble with parliament. Now, the Council of State. We would all agree that the Council of State has an, an imposing name but the way it has so far gone about its work has made it look like an honorific institution without power. Yet, apart from the president, the council has power to advise every public institution in Ghana. Based on my own experience at the Electoral Commission, I can say that the council takes briefings from public institutions and gives them advice in turn. I think it will, be, it will help the public to gauge the council's impact if periodically it issues a report indicating what advice it has given to which institution. In the Council's relation with the President, there is one thing in particular that I think requires clarification. The President appoints some people in consultation with the Council, and some on the advice of the Council. What is the difference? Some lawyers say there is no difference at all and the president can do as he pleases in both instances. But others say that unlike consultation, in the case of advice, the president cannot appoint unless he's so advised. If that is indeed the case, it must be made explicit in any amendment to the constitution so that the president cannot ignore the advice of the council. Now, local government. 
I strongly believe that we cannot achieve any appreciable level of development in this country without fundamental reforms in our local government system. I strongly believe that. Perhaps the failure of our local government system is best dramatized by the not infrequent calls on the president and the central government to provide toilets for towns and villages. That, for me, dramatizes the failure of our local government. Clearly, what we have now is the shadow and not the substance of decentralization. But I think a number of things could be done to make decentralization real. One, we must abandon the earlier idea of gradual devolution of powers, go back to the drawing board, and give the assemblies, district, municipal, and metropolitan real and adequate power powers and resources to decide and do things on their own. Two, I share the view that a district, municipal, and metropolitan chief executives must be elected to promote their accountability to the local people. Three, I also share the view that we should stop playing the ostrich and open the election of the members of the district, municipal, and metropolitan assemblies to political party participation. However, I think that the election formula should not be the first past the post, but the form of proportional representation called mixed member proportional. I'll leave it at that. I cannot go explaining it, but I want you to keep it in mind. No first past the post for electing the district assembly members. Let us try my, my recommendation, the mixed member proportional formula for electing people. I think if we use that formula, it holds the promise of bringing more political parties into the local government system. As it is today, I think it is predominantly NDC, NPP, even though we say it's non-partisan. Everybody knows that the composition of the uh, these assemblies, predominantly NDC and PP. Four, I think it should be made an offense to delay the release of any statutory allocations of funds to the assemblies. The present system whereby maybe first, second allocations do not go. Six months, no allocations gone. I think she made an offense to delay the release of funds. Finally, on local government, my understanding is that the elected members of the assemblies do not receive salary for their work. They do not receive pay. Nor are they given money to develop their respective electoral areas. If this is correct, what is the justification for members of parliament receiving money from the district assemblies common fund? I think it is 
a discriminatory practice, I must discontinue. Particularly as it appears not to have any legal basis at all. I've asked many people, is there any legal basis for them receiving the money? And nobody seems to know. Maybe the journalist here, you can take the matter up and find out whether there is, in some way, legal basis for the um, MPs receiving money from the, from the common fund. If not, it is not good for our members of parliament to live with an illegality. That is all that I want to say about the constitutional issues. I want now to move on to the uh, elections. The kind of democracy that Ghana opted for is one where the citizens choose their political leaders through free and fair elections. It is true that there is much more to democracy than free and fair elections. But there can be no doubt at all that free and fair elections are not only the proper gateway to legitimate leadership, but they are also essential for good governance and democratic consolidation. Obviously, that makes the Electoral Commission a key institution in our democracy. However, that is not to say that the Electoral Commission is the most important factor in a democratic election. I think that this comes out clearly in a simplified definition of a democratic election as a contest among political parties or candidates mediated by an electoral commission and decided by the votes of the electorate. Based on this definition, voters come first followed by political parties and candidates, and then the Electoral Commission in a ranking order of importance of the three main actors in a democratic election. <laughs> I think the justification for this ranking is rather straightforward. So, if there are no candidates, And an election cannot be said to be democratic if there are no voters to decide the winner. For this reason, the primacy of the voter and the attendant sanctity of the duly cast vote are regarded as central pillars of the principles of electoral justice. The ranking also underscores the need for political parties to be closely involved in the electoral process. In this regard, I think that the Electoral Commission must view the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC, as a convenient forum for discussing changes to our electoral practices irrespective of whether the intended change originates from the commission or the parties. The reason is that it is not good practice to foist changes in electoral, prices, electoral practices on important stakeholders like political parties. It is prudent to discuss any intended changes thoroughly at IPAC meetings with a view to achieving consensus. If consensus is achieved, the IPAC then becomes a convenient vehicle for disseminating the changes to the electorate. 
let me say that during discussions at the IPAC, the Electoral Commission is not bound to accept the position, even if it is supported by all the political parties. It's not a voting matter. How many parties do you have? On the books, maybe about 19. How many, how many commissioners are there? Assuming that all of them go to IPAC. Seven. If all of them, then it will be 19 to seven. No, it is not that kind of matter. And the reason why they are not bound to accept some decision even if all the political parties support it, is that the political parties can take a stand which constitutes an obstacle to the realization of the electoral rights of the people. When that happens, it is the duty of the Electoral Commission to uphold and protect the rights and interests of the people. I'd like to give a very simple example. The political parties once wanted the Electoral Commission to make it mandatory for people to produce their voter ID cards on election day before they are allowed to vote. The Electoral Commission said no to this no card, no vote campaign, explaining that it is the Constitution and not the card that creates the right to vote. The card makes it easy to identify you as a registered voter. So on election day, if your name is on the register, which is the legal requirement, but you don't have the card with you, then the onus lies on you to identify yourself to the satisfaction of the persons conducting the election. Fortunately, the political parties eventually agreed with the Commission's position. In contrast, the current Electoral Commission's drive to make the Ghana card the only document for voter registration, when that card is not easily accessible, all Ghanaians. And its refusal to consider the request by the political parties to do the 2023 limited voter registration at the electoral area level closer to the people than at the district level would seem to indicate that the political parties are now the ones defending the interests of the voter. The Electoral Commission has a sound legal framework which guarantees its independence. The Commission has power to make law by constitutional in instrument whereby it proposes laws and Parliament approves them. So the Commission and Parliament share responsibility for changes to our electoral laws and practices. This feature is better suited to protecting the electoral rights of citizens than instances where the Electoral Commission makes law through a minister. Our election structure is durable with effective participation of the political parties in the electoral process. The Commission has well-trained, professionally competent technical staff. These attributes make the Commission well endowed to manage elections. 
The fact that free and fair elections are essential to our democracy means that the Electoral Commission always has to deliver free and fair elections whose outcomes are credible enough to be acceptable as a basis for forming a legitimate government. Of several factors that an Electoral Commission requires to be able to achieve free and fair elections, two are paramount. First, it must make solid preparations from voter registration through voting operations to the collation of votes and the declaration of results. In doing so, it must pay particular attention to points where the election process is vulnerable to adulteration. I'm sure that the Electoral Commission is aware that most of the election controversies in recent times have centered on the counting and collation of votes. For this reason, I consider the setting up of regional collation centers in our presidential election to be a retrogressive step because it increases the number of points at which results can be manipulated. I understand that we borrowed the practice from Nigeria, surprisingly at a time when Nigeria was seeking ways to send results straight from the polling stations to one location. It is to be noted that Parliament approved the practice. The second requirement for achieving free and fair elections is a favorable external environment. In this regard, I have said many times that an electoral commission can make the best preparations possible for an election. But if the external environment is not right, the prospect for a free and fair election can be likened to washing a piece of white cloth in milky water and hoping that it will not be stained. Unfortunately, several aspects of our elections are unacceptable because of murky factors in the external environment. And I want to call attention to four of them. First, violence. Some people say that violence in our election did not start yesterday. No. But instead of decreasing over the years, it appears to be increasing in both numbers and intensity. If our two major political parties are to be believed, they no longer have militias, if they are to be believed. But what is even more worrying is the allegation of the involvement of national security personnel in election violence. I'm afraid this is very serious and foreboding for our democracy. Two, disrespect for other candidates. Instead of mutual respect for other candidates seeking the same office, the tendency has been to show open disrespect for the other candidate and try by any means, fair or foul, to portray him or her as unworthy of the office. Oftentimes, the same attitude is portrayed by the supporters of the respective candidate. 
in such an atmosphere. Political campaigning loses its essence as an opportunity for candidates to tell voters what policies they will put in place to solve their problems and improve their conditions of life. Three, too many promises. In place of enunciating policies, our politicians spend a lot of time making and repeating promises to the electorate. One cannot be sure that even the politicians themselves believe that they can fulfill the, the numerous promises that they make. Anyway, they seem to forget that unfulfilled promises can be a millstone around a politician's neck. The negative effects can be devastating because even party members who were not part of the promise-making enterprise may find it difficult to extricate themselves from the effects. Four, vote buying. In days gone by, whatever vote buying or vote selling there was took place in secrecy. Not so these days. What we have now looks like an open market where candidates can freely buy votes and citizens can freely sell their votes in broad daylight, while we all look on seemingly unconcerned. But it is a shameful spectacle, because vote buying and vote selling are unlawful, and they undermine two important principles that underpin our democracy. Vote buying undermines the idea that we choose our leaders out of our free will. And vote selling undermines the idea that we hold our elected leaders accountable through elections. I believe that our democracy is kaput when election results cease to be a true representation of our verdict on the performance of our leaders. And we cannot therefore hold them accountable through elections. And that precisely is what the emerging open market in votes portends. I'm sure that there are other factors about our elections that you may consider to be unsatisfactory. But the ones I have mentioned are enough to indicate that all is not well with our democracy. In fact, there are additional signs of the deconsolidation of our democracy. That is all I want to say about elections to now. I will now turn briefly to the judiciary. We will all agree that street protests and media wars are not appropriate ways of resolving disagreements over electoral matters. Neither can achieve authoritative and binding conclusions. Besides, Street actions can be costly in terms of human and property loss. With regard to the media, it has become extremely difficult to distinguish between genuine media and counterfeit media because of the preponderance of one-sided, even distorted presentation of issues in the partisan media the indiscretions of some serial callers, especially into radio discussions, 
and the irresponsible use of social media for political purposes. Nor do we know the impact that artificial intelligence will make on elections in view of its ability to create voices and visual images that are virtually indistinguishable from the real ones. Add to this the fact that election-related matters cannot be an exception to the rule of law. And you can readily see why the judiciary is an integral part of our electoral system. As a general rule, election cases are urgent cases that need to be decided as quickly as practicable. Except where the court genuinely does not know what to do in the particular situation. An example of such a situation occurred in Washington, D.C., in America. A candidate was officially sworn into office as a winner in the city council election when all the overseas votes had not been counted. Later, after collating the overseas votes, a different candidate emerged as the actual winner. The new winner went to court. But the case was not decided during the entire lifespan of the particular council, apparently because a situation like that had never happened before. And the court did not, did not know what to do once somebody had already been officially sworn into office. When the council's life ended, the case was dislodged on the ground that the substance of the action was vacuous. As far as I know, allegations of corrupt judges taking money to decide election cases have been rare in Ghana. However, in recent times, Concerns have been expressed about the judicial function in elections. These concerns are encapsulated in two interrelated concepts. The jud uh, judicialization of elections and the politicization of the judiciary. Judicialization of elections refers to the increasing trend of resorting to the judiciary to settle electoral controversies of all kinds. Politicization of the judiciary refers to appointing judges in the hope that they will give judgments that are favorable to a particular political party or cause if the need arises. As to which one comes first, it is like the chicken and egg question. It depends on which chicken or egg one is talking about. Is it the chicken that laid the egg or the egg that hatched into the baby chick? <laughs> so the sequence may differ from one country to another. What we can say for sure is that judicialization begets politicization, and politicization begets judicialization. And the end result is the same. Judges are embedded in the judiciary in anticipation of decisions favorable to a particular political party or cause. I do not know the extent to which judges are so embedded in our judicial system. I don't. But I find it noteworthy that even before the Supreme Court began 
here in the 2012 presidential election petition, some Ghanaians were predicting a six to three verdict of the nine justices based on the number of panel members appointed by presidents of the two disputing political parties. The prediction did not come true, but it indicates that there was a perception that the decisions of our judges might be influenced by political considerations. Be that as it may, political influence aside, judges may give unsound decisions in election cases for two other reasons. The first reason is insufficient knowledge of elections. Judges are not necessarily experts in elections, and they may sometimes give judgment in election cases without realizing the full implications for the entire electoral process. This is often seen in injunctions and consequential orders. For example, the judge once plays an injunction on holding the district level elections. When some candidates went to his court complaining that there had been no voter education at all in their areas. The areas comprised only six electoral areas out of thousands of such areas in the entire country. But the injunction unwittingly covered the whole country. So if the, yes, if that held, means we couldn't hold the elections. We have how many? I don't want to give you a number, but there are thousands of electoral areas. And we complain about six, and we put an injunction on the entire election, thousands of them. It's because he confessed to me later on that he didn't know. He confessed to me, you know, yes. He was one day, I went and sat with him, we were eating, we were having, you know, uh, we were having discussions with the judiciary about elections. And he was sitting next to me, I gave that example, and he said, oh, I'm the one. <laughs> you know? he, he just didn't know. Similarly, hmm. um, a judge once ordered a recount of the votes in a disputed election result case. But also ordered that the ballot boxes could only be opened in the presence of the agents of all the four parties that were present at the initial count. All right? He's given the order. Yes, you have to go back and come here. Then he adds that you can only open the, the boxes when all the people are, you know, are there. As it turned out, hmm, the two parties not contesting the results were simply not interested in the recount and would not be present. But the judge had said we, we could not open the ballot boxes un until all four of them were there. To a number of occasions, we will notify them, we will go, and then only two parties uh, will be present. In, a, in such situations, the EC has to get the decision varied by the same court or by another court before it can act. The second reason for unsound judgment is what may be characterized as the lack of purposive interpretation of the law in full-blown um, election petitions. I like to spend a bit of time on this because this is not as self-explanatory as the previous one. To start with, let me give an example of what I consider to have been a, a purposive 
interpretation of the law when I was at the Electoral Commission. A Ghanaian citizen then living abroad once walked to the Commission's head office and said he wanted to register as a voter so that he could vote in an election due to be held in about two months time. It was explained to him that voter registration officially closed more than a month back. So he would have to wait till the next registration period. Not satisfied, he took the commission to court and the court ruled that under our constitution, the right to register to vote is a fundamental right and it is not within the remit of the electoral commission to decide when citizens will enjoy their fundamental rights. I described that decision as purposive because it was directed at achieving two goals, both of which were consistent with the principles of electoral justice. The first goal was to preserve a citizen's right to register at a time of his or her choice. Since registration or voting is not compulsory in Ghana. Comp registration is not compulsory. Voting is not compulsory. So the citizen maybe initially didn't see the reason why he vote. All of a sudden, he said, hey, now maybe he should be able to register. This is what the judge will settle on us. So it was to preserve that right of the citizen. It is important to note that in principle the decision imposed on the Electoral Commission is many years back. A duty beyond the traditional conception of continuous registration to voter registration every working day. That's what it meant. The citizen had the right to be registered every working day. That's what the judge was saying. So continuous registration did not begin yesterday. That decision imposed on us. The traditional conception of the continuous registration is that you register this time, you keep the names, you register next time, you add them to the old one. You register next time, you add them, you pile on. But they don't have to be done every uh, working day. You can do them at set periods and put them together. And that was a traditional conception. This decision imposed on the commission that every working day, if a citizen comes, must be registered. <laughs> of course, at that time, in deference to the court, we registered the, uh, the person, but we kept our mouths shut <laughs> because we did not have, have the well wither to implement the decision, you know, on, on a full scale. If people had known that we had registered that person, maybe the following day, the people would come, and people would be coming until a day before election day. Right? So we registered the person, but we kept. Yeah. I think two other people came, and we registered them quietly. <laughs> quietly, yes. Anyway, in essence, the second goal of the decision was to tell the commission to establish a cutoff point of voter registration if continuous registration would cause problems 
for its work. A cut-off point means that you can place your name in the voter registration database after the cut-off point. But in order not to disrupt the preparations of the Electoral Commission, you cannot vote in the impending election. You can only vote in subsequent elections. The EC thereafter established a voter registration cut-off point by law. At that time, we had not established a cut-off point by law. But once we have established a cut-off point by law, now, if you came and you said you wanted to register and you came <laughs> after we had cut off, then we will add your name to the database, but you cannot vote in the independent election. I understand that the Commission now has the capacity to do every working day registration of voters in its district offices. Anything that I think should not happen, that is my interpretation. Three things that should not happen on a purposive interpretation of law. One, a sizable group of people should not be denied representation in parliament for a long time. Because that is plainly inconsistent with the idea of representative government. Two, an election case should not be dismissed forthwith on a technicality like, oh, the case was not filed in time, or the lawyer brought a writ instead of a petition. For all you know, the candidate and the voters may not know the filing deadline, let alone the, the difference between a writ and a petition. And yet, they are the ones who get punished. I think that it would be more appropriate in such a situation to find the lawyer and hear the substantive case. Find the, the lawyer and then go ahead and hear the substantive case. Three, a judge should not cancel some duly cast votes and declare the winner of an election. If there is a mathematical chance that the affected votes can make a difference in the result. The reason is that doing so amounts to the judge usurping a function reserved exclusively for the people in a true democracy. It is more appropriate to order a rerun of the election for the people to decide. I wish to make three recommendations concerning electoral accountability and democratic consolidation to conclude my reflections. First, as in all human endeavors, mistakes occur in elections. But genuine election mistakes can readily be discovered and corrected. Not so deliberate wrongdoing. To deter deliberate wrongdoing, all persons connected with the conduct of elections must be held strictly accountable for their actions by instituting a stringent regime of punishment for willful wrongdoing. All categories of election workers must be familiarized with the applicable regime of sanctions during their training, and any infractions must be seen to be punished. Two, it appears that some candidates rush to court 
with election petitions, alleging manipulation of results, primarily to placate their financiers and supporters so that they will be given another chance to be a candidate at the next time. The rush can cause undeserved injury to the reputation of the Electoral Commission and unnecessarily inund unnecessary in inundation of the courts. As we speak, there are well over 1,000 election petitions before the courts in Nigeria, following the 2023 elections. Yes, well over 1,000 election petitions. Some of them uh, will not be concluded you know, before the next election is held. To prevent the rush to court with improbable election petitions from becoming a fashion, I suggest that election petitions that do not succeed should attract punitive sanctions. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Thirdly, in view of the importance of the judicial function elections, I wish to recommend collaboration between the Judiciary and the Electoral Commission to institute a program of continuing education for judges on elections. Such a program will improve the delivery of electoral justice, which in turn will contribute to electoral accountability and the consolidation of our democracy. In conclusion, let me say that free and fair elections are indispensable for the health of our democracy. We must all understand that it is an onerous responsibility to deliver free and fair elections, and that it is in our collective interest as citizens, irrespective of our positions in society, to help the Electoral Commission in any way we can to deliver free and fair elections. The least we should expect from everybody is proper election behavior. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Kojua Farajan, former Electoral Commission chairperson, now 10 farmer. What are you farming? Is it livestock or crops? Eh? Everything. Everything. <laughs> so he has a farm now. We actually dragged him from his farm in the village somewhere to come help us. Thank you so much. I think we can give him another round of applause. Once again, you're listening to the Constitution Day Lecture organized by the Wangana Movement uh, with support from the UPSA Law Faculty and, of course, media support coming through from CTFM and City TV. Like we advertised, there will be a review of this lecture, which will be happening in a bit. But just to summarize a few of the things I took note of, the headlines that, that jumped at me in listening to him, ministers from outside parliament may be better than the current situation. It's a constitutional issue. He talks about that. Council of State appears power powerless, even though it's a very powerful institution. Uh, he says the council should publicize its advice. It's something that would be very interesting. So we know whether the president listened to the advice or otherwise. It's important, I think, for the records. Local governments, a very, very interesting area, is a sure way to development, but it has failed. And he talks about election of MMDCEs, but he says the politicians should be in there. Otherwise, we'll be playing the ostrich. So let's get that done. But something important, it should not be first past the post. Very critical. That's, that's something that's jumped at me. On IPAC, it's just advisory, but it must be listened to. And then again, there are times the parties may not have the interests of the public, the EC should step in. When the EC is not having the interests of the public, the party should step in. I don't know how we're going to manage that. It's something that I just found interesting there. And then the final point, judicialization of elections 
and the politicization of the judiciary, the chicken and egg situation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kojua Farajan. Let me acknowledge a few other people who have joined us since we started. All faculty members of UPSC and UPSC Law, we are really grateful that you joined us. Honorable Samuel Kujia Tua Blakwa, I want to say the flood MP, but let me rather say the North Town <laughs> Member of Parliament. Thank you so much for joining us. Please give us a wave. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Senyo Hosi is the man behind the One Ghana movement. He's running around. I'm not sure he'll be in the hall. Thank you so much, Senyo, for being with us. Uh, we also have Asafo Chiamisa Dazdi, Dazi of the Asogli State. Magblenya, Magblenyo, like Jade Quekem. Apologies, but yes, I've got it now. Uh, Samson Ladi Ayenini is a legal practitioner and a media practitioner. He's marrying the two. Thank you so much, Council, for joining us. Uh, Sanam and Sima Hari from IPMC in our midst. Please give us a wave. Thank you so much for joining us. Abdulaziz Idrisu with Global Holage. Thank you so much for joining us. We also have Ashimizu Afadame, Regent University. Thank you for joining us. Is at the back. Dr. Chris Nyinevi, ECOWAS Court of Justice. Thank you for coming to join us today. Madam Bridget Jogwenuku is with the Progressive People's Party, PPP. Please give us a wave. Thank you so much. Mr. Kwame Jantwa is with the CPP, Kwame Nkrumah CPP. Thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Mauli Abebio, uh, Mr. Charles Mensa, um, Mr. Charles Mensa is at the back there, thank you so much. Paula Simenu, legal attorneys, Reverend Edgar Nashif, Dr. Theo Asamwa, Mr. Viraj Bhatt, and Mr. Charles Mensa, like I said. Thank you so much all for joining us. Let me say that we are live on CTFM, live on City TV. We are live on Facebook, that's CTFM City TV Facebook page. We are also uh, the Daily Graphic, uh, Graphic Communications Group, is also carrying this feed live. When I was mentioning our earlier media supporters, I failed to do that. Um, Class Media Group, also here present, giving us the needed coverage. Let's move on now and do a review of what Dr. Farijan has done. If you look at your program, the first uh, review is supposed to be done by the Honorable Jogati, um, but the lawyers have had a discussion in the background, so the junior will do the review first, then the senior would come and conclude. So ladies and gentlemen, let's rather invite former Attorney General, Madam Marietta Brew, with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, One Ghana Movement and University of Professional Studies, Accra, for inviting me to this important program. And um, thank you, Doctor, for the thought-provoking and eye-opening presentation that you've given to us this morning. I'll comment on a few of them, and then I'll go into some of what I think um, some of the things that are on my heart reflecting on the constitution, elections, and judiciary as well. Now, I agree totally with you about the amendment of the constitution and how difficult it will be to amend the constitution. I recollect in 2014, there was an attempt to amend the constitution to change the date of voting to the first Friday in November. And my colleagues are here if they recollect. It came to Parliament, it was put to a vote, and of course, it was vetoed. We didn't get the two thirds that was required to carry the, the, the vote. And I think there was also an attempt to amend the Constitution in relation to district assembly elections, which also never happened. I don't know whether we'll ever <laughs> be able to amend the Constitution. In relation to the Council of State, the issue of advice and consultation and um, the discussion around it, I think there's been a Supreme Court decision on the issue. And um, the Supreme Court stated categorically that when it says, the Constitution says there should be consultation and receipt of advice, that must happen. You must go, or the president must go for the advice and the, or the consultation 
If he doesn't do that, that is unconstitutional. However, when the advice is given or when the consultation is made, that advice is not binding. And so the courts have settled down that already. With regard to local government <laughs> and the elections, again, that will require, and if we are going to involve political actors, again, that will require a constitutional amendment. How we are going to achieve that, I don't know. But there must be some consensus before we even start the, the, the process. Distribution of funds or allocation of funds and uh, prosecuting um, people who do not release funds early. I'm sure many, 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 many public officers will go. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be prosecuted for that. I don't know how that works because funds have never, ever been released timelessly. And um, our, I mean, my colleagues Joe and Atachia, Ata Honorable Atachia, We've always had problems with this issue and it's never happened. But I agree with you, it needs to be released early so that um, assemblies can do their work and, and all that. The, in April 1992, by referendum, we adopted our written constitution as the supreme law of our land. The 1992 constitution, and that's my um, Leonard Senior Dr. Afrijan said, is resilient and the longest of all. This constitution establishes the three distinct arms of government, that is the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And it reaffirms certain principles, such as the principle that all powers of government spring from the sovereign will of the people and the principle of universal adult suffrage, among others. It also establishes our democratic institutions, such as the Electoral Commission, the NCC, Chiraj, and I think we all know them. The topic for today is a very relevant one, involving three power blocks of our democracy. That's the Constitution, elections, and the judiciary, and it's especially relevant because we are in an election year. Ghana's reputation as an example of a thriving democracy, despite its challenges, cannot be questioned. Since the advent of the 1992 constitution, we have witnessed eight elections, each aggressively and tightly contested by the two main political parties, the National Democratic Democratic Congress, which I belong to, and the new Patriotic Party. Three of these elections resulted in peaceful transfer of power from the incumbent government to the opposition, while in five, the incumbent was retained. This commendable record can be attributed to several reasons, including the credibility, particularly during its early years when IPAC was very functional, there was consensus building and discussion and all that. However, and um, the previous speaker alluded to the issue with public institutions. And he said it was a perception, but let me refer to some statistics. The Afrobarometer Round 9 survey in Ghana to 2022, conducted by the Center for Democratic Development, shows that the credibility of our electoral commission and the trust reposed in them by the people of Ghana has diminished. And why do I say so? The following question was put to the population surveyed, and I quote, how much do you trust each of the following? Or you haven't heard enough to say? The Electoral Commission. Only 9.8% of the population said they trusted the EC a lot. Compared to 20.8 in 2019, 22.7 said they somewhat trusted the EC 
compared to 32.1% in 2019. 27.3% said they trust the EC just a little, compared to 22.2% in, 22 in 2019. 0.5% said they don't know whether they trust the EC, compared to 77 in the 2019 report. And 39.7% said they don't trust the EC at all, compared to 189 in 2019. As an ordinary citizen relying on this data, I can safely conclude that there is an increase in public mistrust of the Electoral Commission. Such a decline of public trust is indeed worrying in an election cycle where the incumbent NPP claims they'll break the eight. And we in the NDC have unequivocally and clearly stated that do or die, we will win the December 2024 20, elections. <laughs> With all due respect to the Electoral Commission and its chairperson, the decline in public trust is not surprising. In a country where elections are fiercely contested and often determined by a tiny margin, the admission of any error is bound to affect the credibility of the Electoral Commission. It did not require a soothsayer to predict this decline in trust in the aftermath of the 2020 elections, when for the first time, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission publicly announced that she had inadvertently announced or used wrong numbers that led to the declaration of the presidential results, and then corrected them without involving the political parties or providing them with a clear explanation as to how this egregious mistake occurred. It is a fact that the 1992 Constitution created an independent electoral commission that is not subject to the direction or control of any person or authority, except as provided in the Constitution. This independence is critical to the functioning of the electoral commission and was enshrined in our Constitution to one, insulate the commission from undue influence interference and manipulation for external, from external or internal forces, particularly political actors, as the doctor referred to, where they can create a stumbling block. And in that situation, then the EC will, of course, or ought to take a decision in favor of the public. Two, it was the, the independence was enshrined in our constitution to ensure that the commission carries out its functions transparently and fairly without fear or favor. It is, however, critical to understand that this independence has fetters. It is not limitless. The constitution makes the electoral commission subject to the principles of accountability and other checks and balances enshrined in the 1992 constitution. As much as the independence of the Electoral Commission is essential, these checks and balances are equally important. The principles of accountability and checks and balances help create a thriving democracy by ensuring that no, breach of gov no branch of government, agency, institution, or individual accumulates unbridled power. These principles help protect our democracy from abuse of power, tyranny, corruption, and the ultimate erosion of our democratic values. Now, one of the primary tools, and um, Doctor referred to the media and the problems associated with misinformation in social media, the um, impacts of AI and how uh, the media in recent times, you can't tell whether they are appendages of political parties or not. So the media is one of those tools. But today I'm talking about another primary tool which was created by the 1992 Constitution, 
for ensuring that the Electoral Commission remains transparent, fair, and accountable. Now, this is the oversight of the judiciary. The judiciary's role is critical for preserving the credibility of our electoral process. Citizens and political actors and political parties must be confident that they will receive justice in court in respect of alleged infractions of electoral laws by political actors or challenges to decisions by the Electoral Commission and that their constitutional right to vote will be pro protected. Proper oversight by the judiciary ensures that all actors in the electoral process comply with the legal framework governing elections. And that's why issues like judicialization of, the, of elections and um, politicization of the judiciary becomes very worrisome because the judiciary play a critical role in preserving our electoral process. However, as a practicing lawyer, reflecting on this critical role of the judiciary, it cannot be denied that over the years, the judiciary has delivered some pioneering or groundbreaking breaking decisions that have greatly improved accountability and transparency in the electoral process, and that the judiciary over the years have protected the constitutional right to vote. And at a later date, I will discuss whether all is still well. But I would like to mention a few of these decisions, starting from 1996. In the Adi versus Attorney General and the Electoral Commission, case found in 1996 to 1997 Supreme Court of Ghana law report. The Supreme Court recognized that the conduct of the National Elections Commission, Electoral Commissioner in refusing to register the plaintiff and other qualified citizens would deprive them of their constitutional right to vote and ordered the National Electoral Commissioner to register the plaintiff and all those who qualify to be registered. The Supreme Court held that the exercise of this right of voting is indispensable in the enhancement of the democratic process and cannot be denied in the absence of a constitutional provision to that effect. In Apalu versus Electoral Commission of Ghana, 2001 to 2002, Supreme Court of Ghana law report, the Electoral Commission published a directive that for the purposes of the upcoming December 7, 2000 elections, only, only photo IDs would be accepted for voting in the general elections. The Supreme Court on December 4 declared the directive as unconstitutional and stated clearly that the courts should protect the right to vote at all costs. Otherwise, democracy in this country would be undermined. In the consolidated cases of Ahuma Okansi versus Electoral Commission and Center for Human Rights and Civil Liberties and Attorney General, found in the 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, and I, I'm sure many of us are aware of it, Prisoner, prisoners were declared to have the right to vote in the absence of an electoral offense. And there are a host of other cases Ajay Chum versus Attorney General in Akwete, 2005 to 2006, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, Appeal for Re and Attorney General, 2010, Supreme Court of, of Ghana Law Report, Kwesi Nyame Tiasie Shan versus Electoral Commission, 2016, where the decisions of the Supreme Court relating to the collation forms for parliamentary and presidential elections enhanced the transparency fairness and accountability of the electoral process. After reading these cases, I could not help but agree with her ladyship, the then Chief Justice Georgina Theodora Wood, when she said in the Abu Ramadan case that, and I quote, electoral justice is legitimately the most effective medium for the protection and preservation of the sovereign will of the people a democratic principle explicitly captured in the preamble to the 1992 Constitution and implicitly reinforced under its Article 1. 
This critical role, universal adult suffrage, and equal voting play in the democratic process cannot therefore be overlooked, end of quote. There are multiple factors for Ghana's ability to overcome the threat of electoral crisis. I would include in that list the crucial role of the judiciary in dispensing electoral justice, the propensity of the judiciary to fiercely protect the constitutional right to vote and enforce transparency, accountability, and the rule of law in the electoral process. If we don't have that, that means people are going to go onto the streets to resolve their issues, which is not, is not an option. I guess this statement brings to the fore the tension between the advocates of judicial activism and scholars of the legal process theory, which will be a discussion for another day. But is everything rosy, hunky, and dory? Maybe this is where I get into trouble, but it has to be said. Not at all. The Afrobarometer survey I cited earlier suggests that all is not well. In addition, some recent actions of the Electoral Commission and decisions of the courts should give all of us cause for concern. And let me just mention a few. The previous speaker talked about a sizable, the fact that a sizable group of people should not be deprived of their right to vote or their representation for a long time. I'll go directly to the case, which is the electoral crisis of Santrokofi, Akpafu, Lipe, and Lulubi, popularly called Sao. It will, be called, it will be recalled that the Electoral Commission, through a press release published on the eve of the December 7, 2020 elections, directed the people of Sao not to vote in the parliamentary elections. However, they were allowed to vote in the presidential elections in the Boim constituency. To date, the people of Sao remain unrepresented, which is a clear violation of the Constitution and the right of the people of Sao to vote and have representation in the Eighth Parliament. This is not just a cardinal sin, as aptly described by Professor Kukwasari. It is a tragedy. It is tragic that this should happen in our modern democracy, and we are all just looking or nothing is happening. I do not see how the creation of the Guan constituency to take effect in this eighth parliament could in any way be a breach of Article 47 of the 1992 constitution when this predicament the people find themselves in has arisen because of a string of mistakes and omissions by state actors. I go to a second point, which has to do with presidential election petitions. The results of the presidential elections of both the 2012 and 2020 elections were challenged in the Supreme Court. Both petitions did not change the final result. However, one major difference between, between the two election petitions is that with regard to the judgment in the 2012 election petition, extensive recommendations were made by the esteemed justices of the Supreme Court, which led the Electoral Commission to commence some reforms. Now, in relation to the 2020 election petition, some aspects of the judgment give me cause for concern. For example, one of the complaints of the petitioner in the 2020 election petition was the manner in which the chairperson of the Electoral Commission on her own corrected errors she made in the computation of the presidential election results after she had issued the declaration of president-elect without consulting any of the presidential candidates in the 2020 elections. This is what the Supreme Court had to say of the complaint, and I quote, it has been argued on behalf of the petitioner that the chairperson of the first respondent could not have on her own corrected the error she made without consulting stakeholders in the 2020 presidential election. No statute or regulation was cited to us by council, and our collective industry have revealed none. This submission does not find favor with the court in view of Article 297C of the 1992 Constitution, which, which 
provides thus. Where power is given to a person or authority to do or enforce the doing of an act or a thing, all such powers shall be deemed to be also given as necessary to enable that person or authority to do or enforce the doing of the act or thing. End of quote. The issue raised by the petitioner was not whether the chairperson had the power to make corrections. The issue raised by the petitioner had to do with transparency accountability and fairness in the manner in which those corrections were made. Can the chairperson make such co corrections without first notifying the affected candidate of her error and, con and consulting them to correct it? The Supreme Court says yes, the chairperson can in the absence of any statute or regulations that says she cannot. I find that unfortunate. Article 296A of the Constitution provides that discretionary power shall be deemed to imply a duty to be fair and candid. Article 296B also states that discretionary power should not be arbitrarily, capriciously, should not be exercised arbitrarily, capriciously, and with bias. In fact, the entire fabric of the 1992 Constitution is built on the principles of accountability, transparency, and fairness. How will this play in the 2024 elections? I hope no <laughs> errors are made, but with this decision, how will this play if it happens again? A third point, the case of the five political parties versus the Electoral Commission, which was filed in September 7, 2023, in relation to the limited voter registration exercise. I have to give a bit of a history. The limited registration exercise was to commence on September 12 and end on October 2nd. The plaintiffs filed a writ in the Supreme Court on September 7 and promptly applied for an interlocutory injunction to restrain the EC from commencing the exercise pending the final outcome of the suit. After much noise and a public statement by one of the flag bearers of one of the plaintiffs, the court allocated a date for the hearing of the injunction in the application for injunction in October 2023, when the limited registration exercise would have commenced and concluded. Not surprisingly, on the scheduled date of the hearing of the application, neither plaintiffs nor their counsel turned up in court and the application for injunction was struck out. Her ladyship, the Chief Justice, explained that the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal do not have special dispensation to sit during the legal vacation and that was why the injunction application was fixed for October 2023 when the courts would have resumed sitting. True. But rule one of the Supreme Court rules, which provides that sessions of the Supreme Court shall be held during term, also provides that the court may sit at any other times directed by the Chief Justice, is an application for injunction filed in September 2023 to restrain registration of voters commencing that same month, not worthy of a special dispensation Special, not worthy of a special dispensation by her ladyship, the Chief Justice. Juxtapose this against a similar situation in 2012 in the case of Ransford France versus the Electoral Commission and the Attorney General, relating to the decision by the Electoral Commission to constitute 45 new constituencies, resulting in the filing of the suit by the plaintiff in the Supreme Court on September 17th 2012, which was during the legal vacation, just like in the case of the five political parties, but this was in 2012. Together with the writ, the plaintiff filed an application to restrain Parliament from considering CI 73, which would establish new constituencies and restrain the EC from using the CI in its preparation towards the 2012 elections pending the final determination of the suit. The then Chief Justice immediately constituted a panel comprising a sole justice of the Supreme Court
to determine the application for injunction, which was duly heard and determined on September 19. By October 4, 2012, the Chief Justice assembled a full panel to hear the substantive rate, and judgment was delivered on October 19, 2012, one month after the writ had, had been filed. The Chief Justice at the time considered the situation urgent because it was an election-related matter. She considered it urgent enough to constitute the Supreme Court in 2012 during the legal vacation. What changed in 2023? My next point, and then I'll conclude. The decision by the Electoral Commission, and this is what I understand the decision is, to close the poll at 3 p.m. instead of the usual 5 p.m and not to use indelible ink during the election. And these two decisions is already causing a ruckus and a stir all over. Changes to the electoral process are bound to happen, but these should prioritize inclusivity, protecting the right to vote, accessibility to the voting process, transparency, and fairness in counting the votes and the declarations. Now, how do these two decisions of the Electoral Commission achieve these objectives? How do they even arrive at this decision? Was it at IPAC? Was it with the political parties? I don't know. And um, we've already been told that regional coalition centers was, a re the decision to create regional coalition centers was retrogressive because it increases the point of manipulation. And um, this was actually laid in Parliament. Parliament didn't pass it, but when you lay the CI in Parliament and um, it's not, how do you call it? Um, Parliament does not vote rejecting it, then it passes into law. So that was what happened. Let me conclude my comments before I get into trouble by stating that any comments made today are not meant to denigrate the Electoral Commission or its chairperson, nor are they aimed at diminishing the administration of justice or the judiciary in the eyes of the public. I'm a lawyer and I practice in the courts. We will not achieve anything by denigrating them. Constructive criticism should be seen as a tool for growth and improvement especially in 2024 with the upcoming elections in a sharply politically polarized country. It is my prayer that 2024 will see an increase in public trust in the elections process and the election management body and that any lawsuits involving 2024 elections, because I'm sure they are bound to happen, will be treated as urgent and dealt with expeditiously. Finally, we should all remember that we have just one Ghana. And as said by Doctor, we are obliged to engage in proper election behavior. Thank you, and God bless us all. Thank you so much, Madam Marietta Bru, former Attorney General. I like the fact that you said we have only one Ghana, and I think it's, a, it's fair at this point to say that if you want to join the one Ghana movement, uh, <laughs> Just, just find any of the team and join, because we do a lot of work. We do, we do a lot of other stuff, apart from what we are doing here. We'll be talking more about that when Senyo Hosi comes up next. Um, let me now invite uh, our next reviewer. And let me say that Dr. Kojo Afarijan uh, can comment on any of the comments that are being made about his speech when he's done. After that, I'll take questions and comments from the audience as well. And these questions and comments could be directed at any of the three speakers. Our next uh, reviewer. He's a member of parliament currently for the Esikado Ketan constituency. He was attorney general in the Kufuor government. Uh, he attempted to be flag bearer of the MPP, but they gave him a showdown. Yonobu Jogati, you're welcome to give us a next review. At 4 a.m. this morning, I realized that Tumara Sanda was going to be the moderator. When I came for 
Takwadi and started writing what I'm about to deliver. And when I noticed that he was going to be the moderator, I sent him a message at 4 a.m. that he should be of good behavior. <laughs> and he assured me that he would be of good behavior. And when I met him here, I repeated and said he's changing. And I said, I'm praying for him. I think my prayers haven't worked. <laughs> so I must continue praying for my young friend with whom I'm well pleased. I said to myself before I came, and I stand on all existing protocols, that I would not engage in responding to speeches, because how can I respond to Dr. Farijan? I mean, the Ghanaian culture does not allow me to do that. So during my speech, certainly I've mentioned certain things he has said, but I, I don't find it in me to say that what he said I disagree with fully. But that's what my editor, I'll respond to it. <laughs> You see, the case of France, regional France, I was lead counsel. My wife, Eva Gatti, supported me, being my junior at the bar. And that the person who spoke for us, or who was speaking in court, is the current attorney general. It was in 2012. And our argument, our entire argument was that Article 296C said that if you are exercising discretion power, you should have, you should, it should be governed by a constitutional instrument. The attorney general at the time was my classmate and very good friend, uh, 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 Ben Kumbo, a man who was his campaign manager when he invested. He opposed me firmly and won the case. If he had not opposed me, like what she's saying would not happen. Like the electoral commission would be governed by specific rules which are contained in the constitutional instrument. So if the electoral commissioner later on decided that it was going to review its numbers, we could have asked the electoral commissioner that under what LI or under what CI were you acting? So it's important in all these matters at all times, and I know she won the attorney general at the time, to realize that some of the actions we take can come back and, and haunt us. Because I remember that case very well, and indeed, even though the Chief Justice gave us a court and so on, by the time we finished the case, I thought I see the Chief Justice has set us up for, for losing because we lost every single application and lost the case as well. That is what she didn't tell me. So the Chief Justice just gave us the opportunity, but the courts were not moved by the fact that we were making an application. They were not moved by the agency of the matter. They were moved in their view by what they perceived was, was the law. And I disagree with the court up to date. Because I think that the effect of that decision is to declare Article 296C unconstitutional. For the courts to say that we cannot implement it because it will lead to a nuclear meltdown, that is not the duty of the courts in my respectful view. They have the power to declare an act of parliament as unconstitutional, but they don't have the power to declare a provision of the constitution as unconstitutional. But please, I was being counsel that matter. If I start talking, I may never end. So let me leave it there. Marietta, that's my little job at you, and let me continue. My senior, who I have much respect for, for the role that he has played in this country, if this country has reached where it has reached today, you may not agree with every decision that he made, but you cannot deny that when the history of our fourth Republican democracy is being written, the name of Dr. Farijan will be written in gold. Congratulations. Sir. The former Attorney General. You know, when I was attorney general, I introduced a rule that every attorney general should have his picture uh, or, or in the attorney general's office. I copied it from the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Local Government. But I didn't leave my picture. I, I, I used everybody's picture. But when I left, about three attorney generals tried to convince me to bring my picture. I refused. I didn't. But when my fair lady said I should bring my picture, I had to bring it. She, 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 she's my dear friend and with whom I'm well pleased. So when she tells me to do something, I do it. But I thank the organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity to reflect as a guest speaker on this all important topic. Our democracy, the constitution, elections, and the judiciary. Our democracy. Just saying this brings me joy, great joy to my heart, because I was born after independence, during the Kwame Nkrumah era, but I don't remember the Kwame Nkrumah era. What I, oh. Dr. Farijan is laughing at me. <laughs> Dr. Farijan was speaking the truth. I don't remember the Kwame Nkrumah era. 
But what I remember is from General Kutu Achampua. I remember that era. During that era, an attempt to impose a dictatorship, couch as union government, was fiercely resisted by, amongst others, Dr. Yahoo Yahoo sitting here, I believe. They formed what they called the Movement for Freedom and Justice. And I recollect as a teenager in France school in Cape Coast, we were warned by the headmaster that the Movement of Freedom and Justice was cut, were coming to Lawyer Bodiman's house near our school, but we should not go there. Come to think about it, maybe it was, a, it was, a, it was rather noticed to us that we should go, because as soon as we heard they were there, everybody left the school and rushed to Lawyer Bodiman's house to see the great men of that time. Of course, one of them is sitting with us, and I want you to applaud him. That's Dr. Yahoo Yahoo. <laughs> Others who were there that day was Okotechi Akwisi Afifa. Mr. G. W. Amatovio, who was known as Mr. Nu. Nana Kufado, the, the present president as well, was also present. Even in that era, during military rule, if Fasim continued to sow seeds of democracy in his students, by setting aside a week or two for what we described as mock parliament. During this period, students were allowed to form political parties, and elections were he held, and the head of state, a student, was elected. One political party that I remember was the Junior Students' Party, which was an audacious but failed attempt by we, the juniors, to democratically take over the school for a period. This was a yearly affair, but unfortunately, almost every event, every year, was characterized by a military takeover by unscrupulous students. And this would bring the whole process to an end and a return to undemocratic rule or the dictatorship of the headmaster and his staff. They'll come and announce that we don't understand what we are doing. They've taken over. They've stopped the mock parliaments. The seed of democracy which was sown in some of us in Ifansen continued to germinate and grow. And in the university, my natural inclination was to oppose the military regime of the Provincial National Defense Council. I did not need persuasion to actively uh, persuade in any activity which opposed military rule and promoted a return to constitutional democracy. So when the AFRC was formed, I supported them because the AFRC was preaching a return to constitutional democracy. As a young lawyer, my desire to see Ghana return to a constitutional elected government did not diminish in any way. I was part of the formation of the new patriotic party, even though I was not a signatory to the incorporation documents which made a personal founding member. I was also part of the team that wrote the Stone Invested, which was written by the new patriotic party after the 1992 general election. Since then, I've been actively involved in the politics of Ghana as a foot soldier from 1992 to 2005, as a member of parliament from 2005 to date, as a deputy minister from 2005 to 2006, as a cabinet minister from 2006 to 2009, and 2017 to 2021, and as a deputy speaker of parliament from 2013 to 2017. These experiences have increased my belief in democracy as the best form of government. I have lived in an era where there was a culture and silence and a muzzle press. Today, what we have is not perfect but it's, it is much better than the era where a few men, be they liberators, redeemers, revolutionaries or provisional, as the military men described themselves, concentrated final legislative and executive power in themselves, and also supervisory judicial power to the extent that they had the unfettered right to dismiss judges as they did fit. It is against this background, and in this context, that I proceed to discuss some aspects of the topic, our democracy, the Constitution, elections, and the judiciary. The Constitution. There are some who preach Amagadon if the 1992 Constitution is not reviewed, and hold the view that the survival of the 1992 Constitution hinges on its total review. I beg to differ. And let me use this occasion to emphasize and re-emphasize my confidence in our Constitution. However, let me permit me to quote the famous speech of Sowa DSC as he then was the celebrated case of Tufo and the Attorney General, when he said, a written constitution such as ours is not an ordinary act of parliament. It embodies the will of the people. It also mirrors the history. Account, therefore, needs to be taken of it as a landmark in the people's search for progress. It contains within it its aspirations and their hopes for a better and fuller life. The constitution has its letter of the law. Equally, the constitution has its spirit. 
It is not the fountainhead for authority. It is the fountainhead for authority for each of the three arms of government. It is the source of their strength. He goes on to say, its language must be considered as if it was a living organism, capable of growth and development. Indeed, it is a living orga organism capable of growth and development, as the body, as the body politic organ itself is capable of growth and development. Quotation end. Mr. Moderator, with these hollow words of Soa Jersey, we're in respect of the 1979 Constitution. They hold true for the 1992 Constitution to my humble view. This being the case, we should hasten slowly on our quest to totally review the Constitution. Some thinking here and there is not what I'm against. The wholesale view is what I oppose vehemently. The 1992 Constitution itself recognizes that a review is possible and considers it has been reviewed once. This was, this was by the Constitution of Ghana, Republic of Ghana, Amendment Act 1996, Act 527. This amendment amended, among other things, provisions on citizenship and provisions on public officers. It allowed for dual citizenship and allowed for public officers to work after the previous mandatory retirement age of 60. With regards to dual citizenship, as a, as a student of investment law, it is my view that it is one of the best things that happened to Ghana in our quest for building a corporate Ghana, which should include Ghanaians in Ghana as well as Ghanaians of Ghanaian descent in the diaspora. As far as the retirement age is concerned, having already attained the ripe old age of 60, I'll say that I agree with the framers of the Constitution because I want to assure you that I'm as strong as an ox and as fit as a fiddle. And I can continue working even though I've attained the age of 60. Our constitution is a living document and is growing, albeit as a constitution, it's still very much in its infant stages. For example, with regards to the question of the separation of power, the council of state and local government, these are areas that we can look at if we decide to embark on some review of the constitution. But with regards to the separation of powers, it's a well-flogged uh, horse. And the argument is that the executive being chosen for the legislature offends against the doctrine of separation of powers. The proponents of that view call for a strict separation of powers, where the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary are separate and distinct out of government. This doctrine of separation of powers, which was first properly formulated by the French philosopher Montesquieu, was formulated to check the abuse of power and to protect the individual from such abuse. The rigidity and purity of the doctrine of separation of powers is no longer the case. And various arrangements have been formulated to ensure that the power of state is kept in check. For example, in Ghana, the Constitution established Commission on Human Rights and Social Justice is mandated by Article 218A to, among other things, investigate complaints or violations of fundamental human rights, injustice, corruption, abuse of power, and unfair treatment of any person by a public officer in the exercise of his official duties. Article 33.1 also gives any person the right to seek redress in the High Court where the person alleges that a provisional constitution on fundamental human rights and freedoms has been or is being or is likely to be contravened in relation to him. That person may apply to the High Court in such situations for redress. These are but two examples of provisions of the constitution that provide checks and balances to ensure that the individual's rights are not abused by the state. An argument for the strict division of executive and legislative power contradicts or is in variance with those who advocate for what they call the Westminster type of government, where all the members of the executive are part of the legislature. In fact, um, the former Prime Minister, um, David Cameron, was made a member of the House of Lords so he could sit in cabinet. So now he's now um, Lord Cameron. Today, we have a, a situation in our constitution where some ministers are members of parliament. In 1969, we practiced what was called the Westminster form of government. In 1979, we practiced what was called the Republican form of government. And all of us know what happened in 1979, which led to the overthrow of the government. So today, we are practicing a combination of both. It is based on our history. Let us tread cautiously, and we caution. And don't let us be in a rush to torpedo our current 
constitutional arrangement. With regard to the constitution, the Council of State, admittedly, the full impact of the Council of State is yet to be felt by a body politic. However, I do not think that the answer is to let the public Council of State publish its advice as a general rule, as has been argued by some. Indeed, I'm of the view, respectfully, that the framers of the Constitution envisage the Council of State as a form of advisory council in the nature of the elders who give advice to the chief or head of family and the customary law. The advice of the elders or subjects is not made public, and so should it be with the Council of State if we decide to keep it. As I said before, there are parts of the 1992 Constitution which we can look at as potential areas for amendment. The provisions on the Constitution on local government, in my view, leaves much to be desired. Article 53.3 of the 1992 Constitution reflects the right, restricts the right of political parties to be involved in judicial assemblies or local government units. Under the recent, after the recent judicial assembly elections, support of the two major political parties claimed victory that they had won the election. How can you claim victory in an election you do not take part in? <laughs> Mr. Moderator, the color scheme of the posters of the various candidates will tell you what party they belong to. Drive to every community. Those who are using red and blue are IPP. Those who are using green and red are NDC. And in fact, they feel proud to go around and tell the NPP people or the NDC people that I am representing NDC or NPP. Whether or not they have the blessing of the party to do that is another issue. But the most curious thing for me was that after the election, on social media, the NPP said they had won 50 something percent. Then the NDC said, it's not true, we won 50 something. And none of the political parties came out to deny it. And nobody can convince me that they didn't see it. Mr. Speaker, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Bordet. <laughs> You know, after 20 years in Parliament, you know, Mr. Speaker is all we remember, unfortunately. <laughs> we must look as elected members of the judicial assemblies, unit committees, and the chief executives on a partisan basis. And also the funding of our representatives at the local level must be examined. But I must say that members of Parliament are not giving funds for development. The Digital Assembly Common Fund is allocated to the districts. The signatures to that account are the district chief executive and the district uh, DFO. And all the member of parliament can do is to request that the funds that have made available are used for a particular project, and they can refuse it. If they think that what you've asked for is not something that they want to do, it's not in line with their project, or it's not, they can refuse it. And there have been cases of a future. And in fact, um, these funds, and when they give you 60,000 for four, four months, they allocate you 60,000 for four months. And as Dr. Farajan said, it comes about three quarters late. <laughs> I mean, it's important that it's said so that the public does not think that members of parliament indeed are giving some money in their pockets. But I agree, we must see how we will fund um, uh, um, assembly members for them to perform their duties. But all said, and also, before I forget, every, any review of the local governance system should look at the role of the chiefs in the governance at the local level. Indeed, there are studies that show that about 60% of the populace listen to their chiefs more than anybody else. When a chief summons you in a village <laughs> for not doing this or doing that, uh, the, the, you go to him shaking like a leaf. And in fact, to exclude them from governance, perhaps it's one of the dilemmas of uh, this constitution. Perhaps it started from uh, the Nkrumah era, where I understand that Nkrumah said, you let chiefs run away and leave their sandals. From that era to now, chiefs haven't gotten their sandals back. I am saying that we should give chiefs back their sandals. They should be part of the local governance sector. Uh, um, Mr. Moderator, all said and done, I'm of the respectful view that the Constitution has served us well. In fact, between 1992 and 2015, poverty in Ghana was more than halved. Between 2015 and 2022, research shows that poverty levels have been fluctuating. The reasons are varied, and corruption is one of the reasons for poverty, but not the only reason. 
1992 constitution has allowed to, the sun to shine on all aspects of governance and public life. And public officers are increasingly under the spotlight. Generally, the independent constitutional bodies and key institutions are being called upon all the time to improve their standards by the citizens. Democracy is deepening every day, and we are in a much better place in the understanding of the democracy when, than when we started our democratic journey in earnest on 7 January 1993 with the coming into force of the 1992 Constitution. Elections and the judiciary. General elections have been held since 1992. After election, we as a people have taken steps to improve the conduct of our elections through consultations such as IPAC, which has resulted in the electoral commissioner improving his performance year on year out. Can you imagine the time that ballot boxes were not transparent? And there was the accusation that ballot boxes were well or perceived that ballot boxes were being uh, stuffed before the election. Today, ballot boxes are transparent. And before the beginning of every election, you are not only show the transparent ballot box, it's turned upside down for you to see that <laughs> there's nothing in it. We have spent a lot of time concentrating on the election process itself. But Dr. Farid John talks about what he calls the external factors. And I think it's about time that we spend some time looking at the external factors. For example, what he talks about the judicialization of elections. What he talks about candidates who are unsatisfied with the results going, and also uh, it was talked about by the last speaker, going, rushing to court in order to keep themselves in the limelight or in order to please their financiers. I'm of the considered view that much as we do not intend to stifle the right to go to court, when you go to court and you have absolutely no basis for going to court, you must suffer the consequences. It is now being taken as public interest litigation. So the courts hesitate to impose heavy and punitive costs. But it can be shown that Mr. A knew or should have known that you have lost the election. In spite of that, you go to court. The court should mount you with heavy and punitive costs. Because if you are not careful, what will happen is that going to court to become another level of election in Ghana. The minute you lose, you go to court. And then you can tell the financiers that I'm in court it will be OK, knowing that it will not be OK. I'm not saying that anybody has done that, but I'm just saying that we must be careful. But if you have a reason to go to court, by all means go to court. And I'm telling you that if the courts decide to find out whether you went to court in bad faith or in good faith, they can easily find out. I am not suggesting that if you lose the court case, it means that you went in bad faith, no. You can lose the case and they will know that you went in good faith. In fact, as a lawyer, I know that sometimes you even lose a case and your client congratulates you. He says, lawyer, I know you did your best, but it didn't work. He knows that you took the matter in good faith. But if you went took the matter in bad faith, you must not only suffer heavy and punitive costs, in my view, you must also be restrained for holding public office for a while because you are undermining democracy. Because the issue of taking every matter to court Perhaps it's one of the reasons why people are losing confidence in the Electoral Commission. And the mining democracy should not be encouraged. Please, I'm a lawyer. If you have a case, go to court. If you don't have a case, don't go to court. Should I say it again, Dr. Farid? Yeah? You agree with me, don't you? If you have a case, go to court. If you don't have a case, don't go to court. It's a simple matter. They say violence begets violence. And it should be completely taken out of our body politic. I'm of the view, respectfully, however, that violence is on the decrease rather than the increase. In fact, there was a time in this country where certain parties were so much in control of certain geographical locations in the country that other political parties could not enter, both sides of the coin. And in 1992, I know that I went and campaigned in a particular part of the country, and I was stoned just for the reason that I, was, I belong to a particular political party. Today, there is no part of this country which is a stronghold for any party. They win the election, but it's not a stronghold enough for them to prevent somebody from going there. There's nothing wrong with you having a stronghold. It's a good thing. <laughs> As a politician, you must work in your strongholds. But there's everything wrong with you encouraging your people to prevent somebody else for coming there. Whether it was direct encouragement or it was natural happening, I can't tell. But what I know is that from 92 to date, today, there is no part of the country that I cannot wear an MPP t-shirt and feel comfortable. There's no part of the country that I cannot go to. And when I say I'm looking for MPP people, some will not appear. I will 
people were losing the place, but at least two or three people were appeared there with that. I mean, NPP. And also, I'm not sure that there's any part of the country that I'm not sure. I'm sure my friend Okujita Black will advise us. But I'm not sure that there's any part of the country that NDC will go to and they won't get even one. But in fact, in the Ashanti region, their votes are increasing. Just as our votes are also increasing in the Volta region. It's a good thing for Ghana. You know, these people, they don't want to clap. Uh, I thought they would clap for that. <laughs> But unfortunately, and it's important that state-sponsored violence should be condemned in no uncertain terms. I mean, it's just an election, you know. And, and, and what, must, what we must all learn is that the four-year cycle comes very soon. It's an election. You win or you lose. And the four-year cycle comes very fast. So we should not see it as uh, do and die or do what is it. Well, you know, you know my answer, I have great respect for you. By the diet that you bought, it do and do. <laughs> there, is no, there should be no diet in this matter. We all want to live to see the glory of the Lord in 2024 and beyond. But there's a marked increase in disrespect for other candidates within the body politic. For some candidates, the way to the top is to destroy other candidates with lies and insults. This is interparty as well as intraparty. It's not only between the two political parties. Even within political parties, it happens. People are creating monsters. It is alleged that they pay others to create lies about others, which they promote on social media and other platforms. The surprising thing is that when you confront the person, that why did you say this about me? You say, oh, no, it's just politics. As if when it's politics, you must accept everything. Even though we have rules to deal with defamation, both under customary law and under common law, perhaps the time has come for us to craft rules to deal with misinformation in our political space, especially with the coming into being of artificial intelligence and social media and so on. Somebody can sit down somewhere and create something that we will all be afraid of, a monster that we have not envisaged. So it's about time that we are talking about it, we start thinking ahead. And I'm not even talking about MDP, MDC, or A, or B, or C, or D. But we know what artificial intelligence can do. And what a few people sitting in a room can create with a, a computer, or even now, even with their, their phone. One person sitting in his room with an iPhone, a good iPhone, he can create a lot of damage. Or a good Samsung as well, please. I'm not, I'm not promoting. I have a Samsung and an iPhone, please. I'm not promoting anybody. You know, uh, uh, my friend there shouted Samsung because he didn't want me to use his platform to advertise for iPhone. Please, iPhone haven't given me any money. <laughs> but closely related to lies and insults is the problem of making promises. In the desperate uh, bid to get political power, be careful not to make promises. And this is my advice to all the people who are going to run this time. Be careful not to make promises. But the funny thing is that even when you haven't made a promise, the media will create a promise for you. Yes, my good friend Omar Osai created a promise for me that I said that within two months I'll build that sky tree. I never said it. And he repeats the promise as if it's the truth, hoping that by lying constantly, the lie will become the truth. He's speaking after me, so I should be careful. Omar, I apologize. I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that I never made promises, but people were making promises for me unknown to me. There was a group of young men who sit under a shed constantly saying, and they, they are my people. When I pass, they give me all kinds of names. After one election, as I passed, I waved and they didn't wave back. So I cornered one of them in his house and said, what have I done to you? He said, you promised to do A, B, C. I said, I promised. He said, yes, you promised. I said, I came to say it. So your car was passing. <laughs> and when we asked the man, that will you do everything we said that you should do, but he said yes. And one year has passed, you haven't done it. The guy sitting in the party car had not even come to tell me that he had impact on a, a, this thing, a voyage of promises for me, without my authority. But even if he reported to me that he had made the following promises, I could follow up. But we must be careful about promises because it, that it undermines the body politic. Promises undermine the body politic. This, unfortunately, is a rough and tumble of Ghanaian politics. 
Mr. Speaker, sorry, sorry. Mr. Moderator, another matter that should catch our attention is the question of vote buy. And I want to, us to look at it in the general framework of campaign financing. I want to look at it in a broader context. Because uncontrolled political fundraising and spending can undermine the democratic process and erode the confidence of the electorate in the political, in, uh, political institutions. In Ghana, as well as in several places of the world, in the world, political expenditure has grown in recent times. Just take a look at the number of billboards and the size of the billboards. And you will agree with me that expenditure has increased. What should we do about this? Because campaign financing raises fundamental ethical questions for democratic regimes. Debates about campaign finances revolve around the protection of the freedom of expression. Some people argue that if I give money to Dr. Yanata Makro, it's a form of freedom of expression. It is my money. I'm funding him because I believe in what he's going to do. Others say that it creates corruption. What should we do as a country? Maybe we should spend a little more time looking at the question of campaign financing. Can we limit the cost of campaigns by law? Can, we, can the state provide some basic funding? What punishment should be imposed on people who breach these campaign uh, uh, financing laws? Mr. Moderator, I've sought to raise humbly some issues and offer some solutions. But let me state once more that I'm of the firm view that our constitution has served as well and will continue to serve as well. Our democracy is growing from strength to strength. Our elections are generally improving. And our judiciary is also growing from strength to strength. On this constitution day, what can I say? That God bless our homeland, Ghana. And I'm happy and proud to be a Ghanaian. One Ghana, God bless you all. Is it they are singing for you? They are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so they just made a promise for you there. And, and so they just made a promise for you. Thank you so much, Honorable Jogati. I think we can do another round of applause for him. Thank you so much. I was going to say former minister for railways, but he won't like it, so I'll just leave it at that. What we are going to do is that the next 30 minutes, we are going to take comments. Uh, please bring it to this side, to the middle. So we are going to take... Um, comments and questions from the audience, and I'm going to invite our speakers back up so that they can take your response, or they can give you responses. So uh, push it a bit that way, and then help me with this podium to this side, if it's possible. Can we lift it? Yeah. OK, that's fine. It's fine. It's OK. All right. Thank you. So we're going to just take a few comments from you. And uh, while we do that, let me acknowledge the presence of the Honorable um, Aid to the former president, flag bearer of the NDC, John Mama, the Honorable Joyce Bar Mukhtari. Please give us a wave. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Ni Amano Dodo, executive senior managing partner of KPMG, is here with us. And we also have Tony Sapon, senior managing partner with KPMG. Thank you so much for joining us. So, um, can I have my key speaker and the two reviewers come up stage? Uh, Dr. Kujua Farijan, Marietta Brew, and um, the Honorable Jogati. Since you have been chairman, you have to be in the middle. Uh, no, no, I want him to be in the middle to cool, you know, give cool heads because we all know that in this country, wherever there's pressure, he's surviving in the middle. So thank you so much, chairman. Can I see hands for those who want to comment or ask questions? All right, and I would, I would be happy if someone can help me with the microphone. Yes, thank you so much. Just uh, I'll tell you who to give the microphone to. Let's start from this aisle. Yes. So just briefly, in 30 seconds, introduce yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Thank you. My name is John Mark Bequi. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Farijan. So I listened to some media reports sometime in August last year where you advised or suggested to the NDC to go back to the IPAC. Now, in this forum, you have also given us the understanding that the Electoral Commission has 
a sound legal regime that makes it independent, such that if the IPAC shouts, or as loud as they shout, or as loud as they make the, uh, the concerns louder, the EC is not bound to, as it were, accept that. Or even if they come to a decision by consensus, the EC can equally by itself also, you know, set that aside and act in the interest of their independence. So my question is, how would you juxtapose your suggestion or advice to a party that feels that its views are not being entertained or accepted at IPAC to go back to IPAC where that body with which it goes back to also does not seek to, you know, accept its views. Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please bring the microphone in front. Yes. Thank you. My name is Kwame Chanto of the CPP. And I want to ask any three of you, but more Dr. Afari Jan, isn't it time for Ghana to consider proportional representation in Parliament due to the kind of raucous behavior that we see from our parliamentarians today? Thank you. Thank you so, Thank you so much. Um, Kwame, do I have any question from this? Yes, let me, yeah. Yes, do the first two for me, thank you, and then I'll come to you, sir. Okay, yes, give to him. No, no, yes. My name is Smiler. I want to find out from those who spoke that proponents of amendment to our constitution, there are those who think that the current process has served us so, so well, has served us so, so well, and they give an example that Currently, our dispensation allowed President Danko Kufuado to reduce the number of his, of his appointments. Hitherto, all calls to compare the president to bring the number of ministers and deputy ministers down didn't work. But when Ghana went to elections and we had equal representation in parliament, the president was compelled to bring the number of ministers down to almost 16 because we don't have deputy regional ministers and it occurred because you have to pick a lot of your ministers from parliament here we are we have 50 50. so if you go for more it means that there'll be pressure on your people to always be in parliament because of this people think that we should rather maintain what we have and do more with what we have thank you very much thank you, thank you so very much uh, Bridget, you had a question yes, yes Hello, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bridget Strubinuko. Um, Dr. Farijan, I'd like to pose this question to you on the issue of vote buying and monetization of our politics. Uh, CDD had a study which proved that there was um, excessive uh, monetization of our politics and illicit uh, funding of our politics. And there were ensuing working group discussions, which had representation from all the parties, including the minor minority parties. And it was interesting to know that the two major parties agreed that they were being uh, bitten, they were feeling the bite of the monetization of our politics. And if they are feeling the bite of the monetization of politics, imagine we the small ones, we've just been eaten up by it. Uh, um, so I would like to ask, what has the EC done? A lot of people say the EC is just a supervisory body over our elections. Does it have a regulatory body over the parties? And does it have the, the, the power to find out how political parties and candidates are being financed? Uh, apart from the, the requirements that uh, candidates should, you know, um, what is the word, uh, uh, file, file our um, the public declaration of our assets. Apart from that, there's nothing else that shows, that uh, uh, requires uh, uh, the EC to look into the financing of political parties. I would like to know what has been done or what is going to be done or can be done 
to look into political party financing, not just the political parties, but also candidates. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me take the last comment from this aisle, from the gentleman in the hat. Thank you. My name is Danny Moore. Yeah, I have a problem with the tenure, the four-year tenure that we have presently in our constitution. And you realize that the first year is for the appointment of ministers. The last year is for campaign and other sort cutting jobs. So if anything at all, and it's going to our panelists, I'm of the opinion that uh, we should have a, one, a seven year, one term, seven year. You come, you serve seven years, you are not eligible for re-election. And I think if we look at that one, that's the only thing I think we, we can do about the uh, Constitution. So uh, the panelists, that's just, for you. Just a uh, question for you. If the person is messing up, you have no choice to stay. No problem with that. Uh, the seven year will pass. There are other organs that will take the person on. Yeah. OK, thank, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Can I have that microphone so that I can? Um, OK, boss, give it to the last yeah, gentleman there before we come here. Hello, my name is um, Enes Kofi Boatin. I'm a lawyer. Uh, can, I have, can I have some silence, please? Let's hear from, yes. Um, my name is Kofi Boatin. I'm a lawyer. And um, I want to ask a question. So one key principle of law, it's the sanctity of law, which makes it predictable in its determination. Now, we would all agree that one aspect of our constitution which has suffered um, certainty has to do with its interpretation and how it has been interpreted. On one breath, the originalist approach has been used for, um, at a point in time to we've looked to living constitutionalism, at a point to we've looked at it or construed the constitution and its provisions purposively. Now, my question to the former attorney generals, are, um, is it possible for us to include or amend the constitution to include some rules? Because we know that the Interpretation Act cannot be used in um, construing the constitution. So is it possible for us to have some rules of interpretation in the constitution as an amendment? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, let's hear now from the speakers. And I'll come to this side of the aisle too. Um, as for the term, four-year term, I'll leave, leave it to you people in office. <laughs> uh, the independence of the EC, let, it, uh, let us put it in proper perspective. Okay? I think it's a good idea that the Constitution guarantees the independence of the, of the Electoral Commission. And what it says is that it shall not take direction from any person or authority in doing its work. It's the way you interpret any person or authority is very important. Any person includes the president, all right? If the president of the country cannot give direction or instructions to the electoral commission, why should political parties be in a position to give instructions to the Electoral Commission? So let us put it in perspective. You are not going to the IPAC to tell the Electoral Commission that you must do this. You're going there to discuss. Look, if you look at the number of uh, changes that have been made to our electoral system through discussions um, at IPAC, you can't believe it. The introduction of the um, transparent ballot box, for example. All right? The idea, you know, the politicians used to go and lie when they lost elections, that, oh, they, when they were bringing their ballot boxes to the team, they were half filled, and so on. So, from just the psychological point of view, it is important to um, remove that kind of um, suspicion surrounding the ballot boxes and so on. So, in fact, it came from the political parties. Why don't we do a transparent ballot box? 
At that time, the Ghana government wasn't willing to do it. It's the Danish government, Danida. We approached Danida. Danida is the one that did our first set of transparent ballot boxes. That removed an important uh, no, uh, misgiving surrounding the election. All right? And the first time we took them to the, 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 the uh, polling stations, people clapped, which had removed one great um, <laughs> excuse that the political you know, the, the candidate used to explain their loss and so on. OK, now we brought, as he said, when we bring it, we turn it upside down. You can see it and so on. All right? So um, the essence of going to IPAC is not to force your, your views on them. If you go, they know that if what you say will improve the electoral process, first of all, it must be lawful. It must be lawful. That's number one. It must be cost if effective. All right? Somebody asked me many years back, when are you going to introduce electronic voting? I said, when my grandmother knows how to use a computer. <laughs> and the person said, I had insulted him. You know, I, I apologize later. But, you know, the, the environment into which you are introducing the, the, whatever the product, the technology, or whatever, it's very important. It's very important. You must... And we, we keep saying that the election administration, for example, you make haste slowly. It appears to be a contradiction in terms, but it's not. That in, te in the introduction of te technology, make haste slowly. No. The country, we started the... Um, mechanization of our electoral system way ahead of a lot of countries. We used to go to meetings and then people would say, oh, we just started, but we have overtaken you. I said, oh, is that so? Be careful. Be careful. Look, in um, Kenya, when they introduced it for the first time, they wanted to do everything. We listened to the vendors that you can do this, can do that, you can do this, can do that. On the day of election, they couldn't do, report it. an election results from the polling stations to this. They had to revert back to that. The same thing happened in, uh, in Malawi. When I went to Malawi, the letter commissioner said, oh, now we are going to send our results. I said, hey, have you tried it? So you can try it in a room here. The vendors will come and try it in a room here, involving only a few people. That is not the right thing. Go and try it. Some of these machines, they operate differently in the south than in the north. When they're exposed to the extreme heat in the north, after a certain period of time, boom, they just go kaput. So <laughs> discussion, bring up good ideas. If everybody thinks that it is a, a good idea, as long as it is lawful, and it is cost effective, the Electoral Commission is inclined to implement it. And that should be the aim when you go to the IPAC. So the, it, it is not incompatible to say that the Electoral Commission is independent and sit at, this, at the same time that go there and have a discussion and try to come to a consensus. It is, um, the two are not uh, incompatible. Okay, the... Um, the next question about proportional representation. Uh, hmm. Well, I remember that the, the Constitutional Committee proposed, yes, the Constitutional Committee proposed that uh, Ghana should try some form of proportional representation. This was shot down by the Consultative Assembly. The Consultative Assembly was the one who said no, no to proportional representation. 
And the funny idea, or funny reason that they gave was that it's too complicated for our people to understand. My God. What about the other countries that understand a proportional representation? Lesotho, okay? South Africa, Lesotho, and so on and so forth. Are they more intelligent than we are? They say that is too difficult for our people here to understand. Paradoxically, they recommended that later on the Electoral Commission may. But that's not a constitutional provision. It's a mere suggestion. All right. So, um, first of all, there are different forms of proportional representation. And if we are going to use proportional representation, we must examine the various forms critically and see which one would be appropriate for us. You know, when I once went to Nigeria. We were doing uh, you know, pre-election assessment. And that commission had recommended the mixed member parara. And we said no. Mixed member parara will accentuate the dominance of the two parties. What you need, what you need is to get, uh, you know, as many parties involved as, as, as possible. So uh, that is why uh, I'm, I'm recommending a mixed member proportional. You know, the one that is being used in, in Lesotho. You know. Fortunately, um, Lesotho used to have a fight all the time when they were using the first part of the post. Since they switched to the mixed member proportional, they have never fought <laughs> you know, over the elections and so on. Yeah, um, the vote buying and the monetization, I think we can we have to separate the two. Monetization, excessive monetization is bad. But there can be excessive monetization without vote buying. All right? And let me talk about the excessive uh, monetization. This was recognized by the Electoral Commission a long time ago. And strenuous efforts were made by the Commission to get uh, what we call the public support, public support for the political parties. Some people say public funding. And we went all the way to um, producing a document over the years describing how the shape of the public funding. And, and let me tell you that this issue of public funding is the one that tells me that our parties in Ghana are not very principled. They have no principled stand. Today, when they are in opposition, they want public funding. When they are in opposition, they want public funding because they have difficulty you know, accessing funds. When they get into power, they don't want public funding. There, there is no principled stand on public funding. And unless we get a principled stand on public funding, um, there's nothing that the Electoral Commission can do to help. In fact, the scheme that, that we did out of the public funds, a certain portion was reserved to support parties that will um, nominate more women candidates. A certain portion was reserved for that. So if you had no woman, woman candidate, then you couldn't draw uh, money from that portion. Because, you know, introducing percentages, the parties won't do it. But maybe if they had to draw money from uh, then uh, they, would, they would do that. But um, the vote buying is bad. 
excessive monetization is bad. Because the people who contribute to the um, campaigns and so on, they don't do it for fun. They expect rewards. And that accounts in part for some aspects of um, corruption in public life. Now, um, the four-year support, no, I think I'll leave the rest of, um, of it to you, okay. So the independence of the Electoral Commission, let us put it in perspective. We don't want anybody detecting to the Electoral Commission. But go there and have a good discussion with them. If what you are saying is in the interest of the country, I think they will look very favorably to it. Um, are you going to do the senior, uh, junior thing here too? <laughs> I, I think they'll do senior. So senior first. Senior first. Yeah. Senior first. Yes. I won't comment. Well, you can't lead me astray. <laughs> anyway, just two things. The four year, uh, the, uh, the gentleman saw the reaction in the room. I think this room is a cross section of Ghanaians. Ghanaians do not want to put their life in anybody's hands for seven years. After four years, you go. If they don't like you, they say, Boko Aya. If they like you, stay. I agree with you that we spend quite a lot of time uh, politicking, first year, second year, third year, and so on. But it will improve over time. And then hopefully also, as we continue to break the eight, we'll have longer uh, government. <laughs> uh, somebody is threatening me, Omara. You know, I'm being threatened. The Omara. speaker has not seen it. You haven't seen it yet. No. Thank you. <laughs> then, <laughs> then also, the lawyer who talked about the different approaches, I, I would have given the dean the opportunity to have written a book on constitutional law, constitutionalism. But I assure you that the Supreme Court is, is tilted towards the purposive approach to interpreting constitutions. They've said it time and time and time again. There are times that they've used it that I've I, I felt that they shouldn't have used it. And in fact, we should not. You cannot limit a court in that way, in a constitution. When Sowa said that the, the constitution is a living organism, he said that in the context of the Supreme Court being in the position to conceptualize or put the constitution in context at every time. There was a time that in America, women did not have the right to vote. There was a time that black people were seen as the refuse of a human being. In fact, there was a time that there was affirmative action in order to today. So I think the Supreme Court has said that there should be no alternative action. Roe versus Wade. You see, so the Supreme Court, that's when people talk about, we have to amend, the Supreme Court should be allowed to grow the Constitution, allowed to give decisions and so on. So, young man, what you did, eh? <laughs> uh, everything's under control. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you pass it on to the other? And then let me add to that, that the framers of the Constitution and their wisdom gave the Supreme Court the power as the only court to decide on or interpret the constitution when it comes to these things. And once we've given the Supreme Court that power to decide or interpret the constitution, I do not think that we should take any steps to uh, put in a law how they decide to, interpret, to conduct their interpretation. But as my senior Joe said, the purpose of interpretation, it has, come to say, it has come to stay. And of course, as you yourself said, there are the other, there's the Interpretation Act and other aids to interpretation that the, the court can use. With regard to the four years, um, again, I mean, we've seen what uh, the reaction of the room and Maybe after we win 2024, you probably will want us to stay in power for another. This, this would be a, 10, this, this would be a good time to promise that <laughs> if you win, you would, you would introduce. We'll deliver so, <laughs> John Mahama will deliver so well that you probably want him to stay on another four years. So four years, I think, is enough time, and we shouldn't tinker with it. Very well. Thank you so much. Let me take questions from this side now. Um, we are running behind time, so um, I'll come to the front row. I just want to take three from the back. So the gentleman in the smoke, please give the microphone to me, and the one in the middle. 
and then this person. So then I'll come to the front. Thank you, Mr. Madrita. First of all, I want us to clap for ourselves as a nation for how far we are, we have gotten in our democratic dispensation. Despite our shortcomings, we have done very well. You forgot to introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Samuel Douglas Kwanza, a tutor from Accra College of Education. Okay. Uh, and then I commend uh, uh, organizers of the program, the powerful men you have brought, Dr. Afarijai, uh, our big man, Jogate, and then Madam. You have all paid your dues, so we commend you for what you have done. You are great people. Now, my question is that uh, we are commending ourselves all right, but there's something coming up, a certain subculture, that is electoral dispute. You know, people have it in mind that they have to win at all costs, especially their followers. And so they want to use any foul means to win, and that leads to electoral violence, and sometimes some people lose their lives. I don't get it. That just mere elections, people will die. Now, what is the judiciary and our security doing? Because after the elections, we don't hear anything about who died, what happened, the one who shot the person dead and all that. We don't hear anything. Very well. I don't know whether the media too, you don't, you are not interested, so you don't follow it. No. So that one, I'm throwing it to you. How are we solving oh. it so Very that we enjoy our peace? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You should also go to the courts and see. Um, I'm, <laughs> yes, the man in the middle. I'm, I'm sure the media covers it as and when the case is called. But if the case is not called, I mean, we cannot. Or Dean, maybe so. Okay, boss. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohamed Sani. I am a security research and um, policy analyst. And then, um, I just have two in one concerns, very brief though. Number one has to do with um, Honorable Jogate's submission, submission on political financing. I want to believe that we've made politics so lucrative and enterprise that even if you have a PAD or if you're a technical in any field, you are disregarding society. And it doesn't equate to the income and even as a member of parliament. And I want to believe that the MPC here can attest to the fact that it's burdening them with regards to society, with their commitment, with the ground levels. So what I'm trying to say in short is that can we have a way whereby we can make politics a regular career that anybody can choose to do so that those who have the nation interest at heart, which the USID will call natural leaders, can come to the forefront of leading and delivering service to the good people of Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you so Number much. Number two, I just want to no, add no, that. No, I don't have time for two. I don't have time. For, sorry. That was a, yes, the man in white. Yes. Um. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Albert Kwashiga. I'm a member of the UPSA Law School faculty. Um, I've, I've heard um, comments being made. I think it was made by Dr. Kujua Farijan about putting in place punitive measures for persons who go to court with election petitions and lose. And I, I think that Honorable Jogate also supported that view and said that there was a need to punish people for, for that. Now, I've been wondering exactly what the basis for that sentiment and recommendation is. Does it have to do with anything that happened in our country? From 2012 to 2020, I, I know that we've had two election petitions. Now, as far as I see it, I do not think any of them were frivolous petitions, actually. Now, in 2012, they caught, the decision of the Supreme Court was so close that one could only come to the conclusion that the cases, the case that was taken to the court, the issues that had to be decided were not frivolous issues. And so people go to court when they are, they are convinced that there's a real cause of action. In 2020, there was an attempt by the respondents in the case, for instance, to end the life of the petition. And so there was an application to say that the petition that had been brought in real terms was no petition because it had to do with declaration of results. In effect, what they were trying to do was to end the life of that petition. Supreme Court ruled on that and said that there was a matter to be investigated into. We have had two so far. Unlike other countries like Nigeria, Nigeria has had its first petition like in 79. We referred to Bush versus Gore in 2000 as if it was the first case of the other cases. Now, what I'm trying to, the point I'm, so I'm, I want to find out what is the basis 
for that sentiment which is strongly expressed because I disagree with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Please give the microphone to the MP in front of you. No, to your left, to your left. Uh, Honourable Member of Parliament for North Town. I want to hear from minority before majority, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me also commend the eminent speakers for the very elucidating thoughts that they have expressed this evening. Uh, my first concern relates to the substantial time that we have spent on uh, electoral disputes. And the speaker before me, uh, Mr. Kwashiga, has uh, made that point. And, 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 and I'm wondering why we are not paying uh, equal regard to the victims of um, injustices in elections. Uh, as we speak, the 2020 election led to a situation where eight people lost their lives. Those people have not received justice. Uh, we don't appear to be focusing on that. Um, does that not embolden people going into the next election uh, where impunity can run sway and people will take the law into their own hands and, 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 and think that they will get away with it? Um, I filed a petition at Shraj. Uh, after a year of investigations, a lot of back and forth, uh, Shraj concluded that their hands were tied uh, because uh, those cases are in court. What is interesting is that uh, you have uh, the Attorney General who uh, attempts to show some interest, so the matter is then uh, categorized as a matter in court, and that's it. It's not being called. I've been following the matter keenly. Um, there's no serious prosecution going on. But because the matter is in court, then Shraj's hand is stayed, and we don't have justice. So I'm very, very worried about that development and what it portends for peace and security uh, going into this year's election and subsequent elections. I also want to raise the issue of the cost on elections. And this is to Dr. Farijan. Uh, from where we sit in Parliament, we are spending so much on elections. I don't know if you have some reflections on how the Electoral Commission can streamline, because this is a country struggling. If you take the 2024 budget, we have approved 786 million Ghana cities for the 2024 elections. That's a staggering sum. In 2020, because the Electoral Commission said they have to buy equipment, which we thought, we as civil society, uh, thought that there was no need to buy those equipments. We spent over a billion, it was a billion and 63 million Ghana cities. Imagine what a billion can do. I mean, those of us who are from rural Ghana, where even portable water is an issue, you know, healthcare, Basic hospital amenities remain an issue, incubators, still an issue. Uh, so the cost of elections, yes, you spend substantial time on the politicians' monetization, which I know is an issue. It's, it's, it's important to reflect on that. But the Electoral Commission itself, how much it is spending, and who watches the watchman? I mean, they just you know, bring the bills. We have to approve it. And Dr. Farajan, you know that since the 2020 election, the development partners have pulled out. So we are now funding fully. The Ghanaian taxpayer is called upon to fund these elections fully. And the cost keeps ballooning. What can be done to reduce the cost of elections and to make the Electoral Commission more efficient? And finally, my final reflection, Dr. Farijan, can you please help us? Why is it that when political parties are in power, they appear so comfortable with the Electoral Commission? They're so cozy. Um, suddenly, all is fine. It is the opposition parties who are crying wolf always. 
and making all the noise and they should be ignored. Um, really, what, what, is there some, some magic? Because I've been wondering. Uh, I, I, I've never really been able to get it, you know. So this, this independence of the Electoral Commission, is it that the independence is only felt when we get into a position then we know that the EC is so independent and uh, they don't listen uh, to the opposition parties. Uh, so, I mean, it's been a trend for, for some years, and, and, and I think that Ghanaians would really like to know if there's some secret, uh, if probably there's some high-level meeting that takes place right, between the electoral commissioner and the sitting president okay. that nobody is aware of. And related to that, Umaru, oh, related to that, mm. in 10 seconds, Related to that is, and I know my big sister Bridget may not be too comfortable with me on this, but IPAC has been mentioned extensively in this discussion. There is a growing trend where it does appear that some of the parties, and I just don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be accused of. Um, uh, pointing direct fingers, but the bigger political parties appear to go to IPAC with their uh, with their allies. Concerns have been raised now that if the electoral commission was doing its work well, strictly enforcing Article 55 of the Constitution, particularly 55.7, that the parties must have representation in all their branches, that they should have offices in two thirds of districts across the country, a lot of these parties don't qualify to be at IPAC. So IPAC has become, let's mobilize as many people that we can get on our way on the streets. Um, and the Electoral Commission is also not doing its work. And, and I'm not saying that some of the parties here are probably one of those. But we all know. Some parties only exist on paper. We, we all know that. Okay. When is the Electoral Commission going to really clean up so we sanitize IPAC, and Article 55 will then be respected. So we really know what a political party okay. is, okay. so that IPAC will be credible. So it doesn't become we have mobilized you know, those who we can, who are uh, ready to be bought. And the monetization is not only you know, at the polls in terms of buying delegates, but it, it involves all of these things. Okay. And, and, and I just thought that. Uh, it would be great to hear what Dr. Farijan has to say about a lot of these, you know, okay. uh, organizations you can't really call political parties thank who you. satisfy the rule Th under thank Article you so 55. Much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Honorable uh, Blackwa. Let me hear from Honorable Atacha, yes. Samuel Atacha, okay. MP for Ibuakwa South. Yes, mine is to um, comment the um, big brains assembled here, and I've enjoyed the scholarship of this moment. I have to be very, very honest, especially the one coming from um, uh, the Attorney General and then Rabu Jogate, but I was also very elated that uh, age has not enfeebled the mind of Dr. Farajan. You have a very solid mind. You have a very solid mind. Well, I am a member of the Special Budget Committee of Parliament, and we approved the budget of the EC. And people do not see the factor that when they quote monies, it's just a quotation. The critical thing is the releases of the money to apply to the functional time for them to do what they do. So you should bear that in mind. If we're not careful and you bring a budget, the budget is a budget. And when even the budget is approved, for you to get the money to perform is another matter. But when you talk about the, um, the budget of the EC ballooning, uh, I thought you, you would talk about financial malfeasance, which has been exposed by um, uh, 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 the entity that looks into public press. Auditor General. The Auditor General. We are yet to see that it's been very serious financial malfeasance, so we should be careful about some of these things. But what I, I want to say something which is very important, and he was trying to stress it. There's nothing which is wrong with receiving good advice because you are a stakeholder in the electoral process. But what is very serious that I saw, even when we were doing the budget for the EC, is the dictatorship of individuals 
who believe that that should survive the independence of the and any independent but above this kind of dictatorship. So when you approach an entity that has um, constitutional independence with, uh, with the greatest of respect, with very persuasive argument, uh, I mean, bereft of, I mean, insults and, you know, fire play and um, <laughs> it won't work. So please, the political party should be very careful. We know the frenzy of winning power. We know. We are all aware. The temperature of some people who believe that if they don't win, something is going to happen and the rest of it, no. But that temperature should not equate to the dictatorship. They will certainly rebuff. They might not even look at what it is. But when we are very, very piped down and we project sound advice, they are also rational in my views, and they will accept what we are doing and then the peace will be the outcome. Okay. So this is a little contribution I want to make. Thank you so much. Please give the microphone to the chancellor for me. Okay, uh, former NCC boss, you wanted to say something just in a minute. Uh, then I can come to the chancellor so we can wrap up. Thank you very much. Firstly, let me um, say I've enjoyed the lecture. Um, I think we really need to, if I may use this word, revitalize IPAC. I saw in Liberia just this past or 2023 elections, that Liberia had a, almost like a defunct structure similar to IPAG, and they call it the Interparty Consultative Committee. But knowing the impact of IPAC on consensus building towards you know, the electoral process, building the integrity of the system, it was one of the things that we fought hard at, uh, in Liberia during elections to make sure that the IPCC in Liberia worked. It was revitalized and it really contributed to the peaceful outcome of Liberia's election. And I think that um, for us having an IPAC that is almost defunct at this time, it really is um, retrogression from on my part. And I think that it's important for all political parties to be on board to make sure that IPAC begins to function as it once functioned. Um, Dr. Farijan, you're a legend. And it took me to be in um, ECOWAS to really appreciate what you bring to the table through your experience. I mean, when you talk about elections in West Africa, everybody mentions your name. When I, when I say I'm from Ghana, and I was in the, in the heat of elections in Liberia, everybody will ask me, oh, Dr. Farijani. So we must really leverage on the gem that we have. This is, he is a national gem, we must appreciate him, and you should avail yourself to speak to Ghana and to the West African sub-region some more. Okay. I also realized that election funding in these times is becoming a very crucial issue. I saw in Liberia where the donor partners said they weren't funding, development partners were not funding elections in Liberia as we saw in Ghana in 2020. And you see the impact on the national economy. It's important that um, we begin to talk about how we drive down the cost of elections because it has an adverse impact on our national economies. So those conversations for me are very necessary and I'm sure Dr. Farijan, your um, experience would be very relevant to this discussion on how we drive down the cost of elections. One billion last year, last election, I mean, we can tell you it can do so much for our country, and so we need to drive that down. And then the, somebody raised an issue on um, elections, elect, electoral violence victims. I was part of um, a committee that was set up by CDD that was looking into um, persons affected by electoral violence, and uh, we began some good work on that. I don't know how far CDD has gone with it, but one of the issues was um, funding. So it, it will be important to follow up with CDD and find out what they've done on this. But above all, let me just say that Ghana is still a shining example in the West African sub-region. When it comes to our democratic credentials, when it comes to how we conduct elections, how we're perceived to conduct elections and as you know, through a peaceful means, 
Ghana has still stands so high. And when I was here, we used to, I mean, we were all part of, there's so much going wrong that could be done better. But out there is a different perception. And we need to keep up that image by having these kinds of conversations to truly deepen our democratic credentials here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Madam Josephine Nkrumah. Uh, please bring the microphone, starting with uh, Madam. Uh, while we are doing that, a Minister of State has sent me three questions that says, he says I should ask you. Um, he says, one, I should ask you about decoupling the Office of Attorney General and Ministry of Justice, what your thoughts are. <laughs> Two, the, a cap on the number of Supreme Court judges, what do you think of that? And three, the scrapping of deputy ministers. These questions are coming from a minister of state, but you know, I cannot, so okay. anonymous. All right, thank you very much. Let me start with the first one, decoupling the attorney general from the minister of justice. And I believe the discussion always comes up when it comes to the issue of fighting corruption. Um, when you look at the constitution, it's article 88, I think, it talks about the Attorney General being a cabinet minister. It does not say that the Attorney General, it does not say that the Attorney General is actually the Minister of Justice. It's just by convention that we have done that over the years. So you can definitely have a Minister of Justice who's also not the Attorney General, even though I don't recollect that we've done that in recent history. If the person is asking this question because of the issue of fighting corruption. They are talking about the independence of the Attorney General and um, the fact that there should be no influence because as the Attorney General is appointed by um, the President and sits in Cabinet. And so, I mean, of course, there is a perception that there will be some influence on the Attorney General. But I don't think decoupling the Minister of Justice from the Attorney General is what will solve the situation. There are other ways, for example, create an independent DPP. We've seen the creation of the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Another way is probably empower Chiraj to prosecute corruption-related cases. So yes, you can decouple it, but I don't think that actually solves the problem. Now, the second issue has to do with the cap on the Supreme, Court, Supreme Justice. Court Justice. And is the question, should we cap it or not? Yeah, that's your view. Not to cap it. I mean, I think there are different views on this. My view is that capping it, I mean, it, it's about the, the, the person who appoints. In the past, we've never had more than 12, 13 Supreme Court Justice, even though there's been no cap. In recent times, we've seen as many as 18. So I don't think the issue really has been the, uh, the fact that there's no cap, because when there was no cap, nobody appointed more than a certain number. It's about the, the discipline of whoever is appointing to ensure that I do not appoint more than a certain number of judges. And the third one has to do with... Whether there should be deputy ministers, whether we should scrap that whole office entirely. I don't think so. Okay. We all can right. have deputy ministers. Not for all, maybe not all ministries need deputies. Some do. For example, the attorney general will need deputies. Minister for finance will need deputies. I don't want to mention any right. other okay. office and say it's insignificant, okay. but... All right. <laughs> Some, <laughs> some will need okay. and some may, may not need. Right. Do you have any response to any of the comments um, from the audience before you, I come to Honorable Jogati? Okay, so let me just talk about um, the punitive measures in respect of um, failed election petitions. I, I don't think the argument was that once you go to court and you fail, then you should um, pay. You should pay. I mean, sometimes some suits are so frivolous that it's obvious that punitive measures or punitive costs should be awarded. I think that's what we are we were talking about. And as the speaker indicated, the last two election petition, presidential election petitions, were not, were not frivolous in any way. And um, it's not just about presidential elections. 
There are also petitions in parliamentary elections and other, ele other elections. I'm sure you may even see some in districts. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a question. Um, there's a point that has been made that you, you decide to proceed to court to satisfy your financiers at all. There is another view that you go to the court to satisfy your foot soldiers who are angry and throwing stones at your convoy. What if for the purpose of peace, go to court and then when you lose, then at least they have some other person to blame than you? If it is frivolous, you go to court on a frivolous claim. I think that for every case, not just election-related um, disputes. There should be punitive okay. costs, but I mean, if it's not and there is merit in the case, why should you be mocked in heavy costs or, or, or damages or whatever? All right. Uh, Thank you. Before I go to Jogate, he said something to you about the do or die that you said. Okay, he do asked, or he do. Asked, he, he asked you to recant. <laughs> do or do. So you have amended. <laughs> because amended. on constitution, they really want to use die. Thank <laughs> you so much. Do. Honorable Jogate. Thank you very much. I'll start from the last point. The, the question is frivolity. And as she said, from your own explanation, the last two presidential elections were not frivolous. And when you go to court, there's a difference between a frivolous and vexatious action and losing a case. I mean, you can lose a case even though it is not frivolous. It's the balance of probability. On the balance of probability, the courts believe A rather than B. But you run to court. And don't forget that we're not only talking about presidential elections. You run to court accusing Mr. Kwashiga after he has won an election that in some particular police station, you didn't mention a police station in Kita, maybe AME Zion or something. But I know your brother, you know, you can't hide. <laughs> when I was deputy speaker, I was recognizing him all the time, was my friend, that <laughs> Mr. Kwashiga in Kita, for example, has. Uh, he did this here. Then you mentioned another place. He did that there. You actually mentioned places. No problem. You file your process in court. Now the time has come for you to come and prove your case. There's become a war. Then why did you go to court in the first place? And another thing that I didn't say about parliamentary elections too is that it should also be time bound. The famous case of Isaac Amu, it went on for four years. You see, because just now what can happen is that, especially in these close elections, People can file 10 <laughs> suits in court to create confusion generally. There are even 10 of your MPs, and while they filed it, then they'll be saying that even the fact that they filed it, you cannot go to court. I mean, they'll create all kinds of confusion. So if it's within a particular period of time, and I restrict my, my, my what I'm saying to frivolous and vexatious matters, and I go further than punitive costs, you know that, first of all, they, they, they don't award punitive costs because they take it as public interest litigation. It's litigation in the interest of public. How can a lie that you know is a lie be public interest litigation? It's private interest lies. <laughs> so they should punish you. Apart from that, they should even ban you for standing election for a period of time. But, I mean, the, it's not every frivolous matter, but they should see that there should be a graduated sentence. Otherwise, who arrive at a situation that everybody who loses an election will run to court. Yeah. And it, we can't afford that. Then you asked, and they, they asked a question about the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice. Can I answer that? Yes, you are free to. Okay. First of all, like she said, it says there shall be an Attorney General who shall be the Chief Lady. It doesn't say there shall be a Minister of Justice. And people make a lot of um, noise in quotes about the Minister of Justice position. It's nothing. <laughs> yeah, she's just a supervisor over some agencies, law reform commission, and so on. And they are not the boss there. They have a board, they have a, a chief director, they have a CEO. So what you do is that you take their, their budget to parliament and you appoint people onto their board. The Register General is more or less independent. The copyright I'm sure my time, law reform commission, legal aid, they are all. It's the Register of Companies is now independent. So you can even take away the name Minister of Justice. But the person who performed the same function, like she said, we have formed an office of special prosecutor who is supposed to um, prosecute independently. What, what baffles me is that at the same time, when prosecution is not going on, then we blame the attorney general. The attorney general is not prosecuting anybody. But you formed an office of special prosecutor. And perhaps what we need to do is to have clear prosecution guidelines. In the UK, there are prosecution guidelines. There's a, Assess, there are various bodies in the UK that can prosecute. Who can prosecute what? So the Attorney General is left in peace. 
and I speak for an attorney general, regardless of political persuasion, because you don't form an office of special prosecutor and then blame the attorney general if he's not. The same man, if he goes to prosecute his friends, his um, political colleagues, to do say he did it because he wants to cover up. So you have, we have put the attorney general in an impossible position, and it's not right. And then he asked about this last question. You served as a deputy minister. Is that a useless office that should be scrapped? Not at all. You see, there are various reasons why people serve as deputy ministers. And in fact, when I was deputy minister, I heard that President Kufu was about to do a reshuffle. And one very senior member of our party then told me that, oh, you've done well as deputy minister. I said, what have I done? I haven't done anything. He said, yes, but you've done well because you haven't done anything wrong. So you've done well. <laughs> so <laughs> then he said that, you know, if I was President Kufu, now you finished Attorney General, so I'll take you to Minister of Finance or Trade. I said, what am I going to do? They said, no, no, no. Deputy ministers, what they do in England is that they move you around. So by the time you're, uh, they, they are not preparing you for today. So by the time your government comes to power in 2008, so, so you are ready to be minister. There's one deputy minister sitting in this room, former deputy wants to be minister, I know that. Because he's prepared, you know, after, why are you, my friend? I haven't mentioned any names. <laughs> because now he's prepared. It prepares you for the position. And in fact, if I, if what to, I did as he a- He wants to be running mate, please. We heard that too. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. You know, this man doesn't like any of us. Okay, that black one, what have we done to him? <laughs> I haven't mentioned I, I have I, mentioned any. I thought we were not mentioning names. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that as deputy minister, I must say that what I did as Attorney General, my role as Deputy Minister helped me a lot. So when I moved into the position, I wasn't completely blind. I mean, you can come straight from outside, private practice, you can be the best lawyer. When you walk into Attorney General's office, it's a different story. So it's a good position, but there are some ministries with the greatest of respect which may not need Deputy Ministers. And if you talk about a cap of Supreme Court judges, I happen to I'm not part of the appointments committee, but the last vetting of the Supreme Court judges, one of my classmates was being elevated to the high office of uh, Supreme Court. You know, one of the most brilliant people in our class. I won't tell you his nickname, but he's a maritime lawyer uh, in, 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 uh, in Tema. And all the judges said without uh, any hesitation that the, the amount of work that has, is now imposed on the Supreme Court he said that if they don't have the numbers, they can't survive. Because in our Ghanaian constitution, everybody has a right to start from the high court to the court of appeal to the Supreme Court. I was discussing this with a lawyer friend of mine, and he said that one of the saddest days in his life was sitting in the Supreme Court, where the whole panel, chaired by his uh, ladyship, the chief justice, the then Supreme Court the chief justice, was delivering a ruling on one room in a family house. A dispute of our own. It has started in the High Court, <laughs> went to the Court of Appeal, and to the Supreme Court. And whether the Supreme Court liked it or not, they have to sit down. So, so your view is that we should not cap it because the work may demand that we have more. That is what all the judges said. The judges mentioned they have the constitutional jurisdiction. They have the super, that's what the judges said. And you agree with them? I don't know the amount of work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, when they asked Jesus, <laughs> When they asked Jesus that, are you the king of the Jews, what was his answer? You said it. I'm telling you what the Supreme Court judges said. Very On that right. note, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, please give it to the chairman. Let him conclude for us. Okay. Well, I, am, I think my colleagues have covered a lot of ground. Let me say that when we talk about uh, petitions, we're not talking only about presidential election petitions. If it were only presidential election petitions, I don't think anybody would get worried about that. Um, the petitions in the um, <laughs> parliamentary elections are also, you know, uh, to be taken into consideration. Um, there's some aspect of the petitions that you don't see. You know, when they have sent it there, they go, you know, amending the petition, you know, and so on and so forth. Sometimes they amend six times in the same uh, petition, anyway. So, but we're talking about uh, petitions which patently have no, uh, <laughs> yeah. And they're not likely to succeed by, by anybody's uh, 
my attention. You can see that you know um, those ones need to attract punitive actions. Um, so that um, when you say that uh, the EC is you know, appears to be cozy with um, governments, government in power. <laughs> I think you have, uh, you have it all wrong. Let me tell you, let me tell you, when I was there, you know I knew um, President Mills very well from Achimoto School in, 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 uh, in Legon, when me, him, and the current president used to play on the Legon football team, all right? Yes, the three of us, we used to play on the Legon football team. Mills never mentioned President Mills. When I say Mills, you know what? He never mentioned my name. He had a nickname for me. And that's what, unless it's a public place for example, he would never mention my name. But during his presidency, I had more trouble with his lieutenants than with anybody else. I had trouble with, you know, people in the party you know, than any other um, in any other government. So it is not true that uh, you know, relations between the EC and the, uh, uh, the government are always cozy. No. And then for your, um, the course of elections, it's unfortunate. To you, as a candidate, very what? Very high. The Electoral Commission as a, you know. But the course of elections, so far as the Electoral Commission is concerned, you people in Parliament, you sit down and look at the budget item by item and approve it. If there are anything there that you think are not necessary and so on, why don't you take it up? <laughs> no, no, okay, yes, I say I need it, but we, you know, we sit down and justify uh, the need. You don't, I don't just send you the budget and then don't meet with you. You call me to come and justify uh, all these things. Why do I need 20 tables? What am I going to do with them? And I have to justify them, every single item in there. So if there is any here, uh, the two of us, the Electoral Commission and Parliament, we, we, we have to take a collective responsibility for the um, rise in the course of elections. You are supposed to scrutinize the budget of the Electoral Commission and give them the And let me tell you, you see now the, 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 the uh, donor partners are uh, uh, withdrawn. When I was in the Commission, I never did a budget thinking that donors were going to give us money. I did a budget thinking that this is budget for the Ghana government to pay. Yeah, the Ghana government didn't have money and you want to go and ask people to, that was a different thing. The monies that we asked donors to give to us was for things that were not to support the core budget. All right? You want to go and do special education for handicapped people, and so on, all right? You appeal to some of these things and they do it. So I'm not surprised that they, they, you know, that they are withdrawn, but let us scrutinize the budget very carefully. That, that, that is the only way. And um, on the other hand, let me say that if you don't give the Electoral Commission enough money, they are tempted to cut corners in their preparations. You know, I suspected that the unwillingness of the Electoral Commission to go to the, 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 the electoral area level was because they did not have money to do it. That was my suspicion. All right? That is my, my suspicion. Because they would have done it. As you go now, you are paying more. Because you are multiplying the, the, the equipment, you are multiplying the, uh, the best uh, the person there. So please examine these things very carefully. And, and I also want to underscore this. Don't let us 
go to the IPAC with a belligerent attitude. Please. The postures are very important. All right? If, well, in my time, nobody would do that. But if you did it, you know, I would let you know that uh, it is unacceptable. So please, don't let us go there with posturing and so on. Let's go there and say that we're going there to have a good discussion. It's a give and take a good discussion. But yes, I did recommend that the, the electoral and the uh, NDC should, should go back to the um, um, IPAC. Because you see, the IPAC is for all the political parties, you see. And I don't agree that, uh, you know, there are, there are small parties and big parties. But as long as they are on the books, and let me tell you, there was one time, you see, there was one time when we did, you know, <laughs> a scrutiny of the things that we're supposed to have before, you know. And we discovered that no party really by the this qualified winner. You see, so what we said is that we cannot do a partial interpretation of the law. That's what we said. You know, now maybe, maybe now, if you do the audit, some will, uh, will qualify, but there was a time when they, look, and even after the audit, you know the kinds of tricks that sometimes uh, the parties play. Now, there was a place I was in charge of the area, and there was, uh, you know, the, these uh, metal things, how do you call them? Container. Yeah, container. I was in charge of the region, and I used to pass there all the time. It was a place where they used to sell cement. <laughs> then all of a sudden, we announced to the parties that we're going to do, of course, you have to tell them that we are going to do <laughs> audit. Then I went there, no cement. They had painted the, <laughs> with, the, uh, with the parties, <laughs> you know, <laughs> symbol. What can you do? There was somebody there with a desk and this one. So we went there. So they have an office. We left. Three weeks later, they, they were selling cement. You know. In Accra here, in Accra here, there was, you know, there was, there was a party in Accra here. We went, you were supposed to have, you know, regional office and, and, and this whole office. They had an office in the room, you know, and table and people here, table and people there. I said, what did it say? This is the regional office and this is the, this, this <laughs> office. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> it, is, it is difficult to do the audit. It is difficult to do the audit. Yeah. So they remain on the books. If they come, let them have this may a discussion. It's all right. And you see, it's not, it's, it's not a place where you are going to vote and say that we voted and there was this and so on. Because, you know, it's, it's not a voting place. So let them join you and have a discussion. They may have a very interesting idea to continue. Okay. okay. All right. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much. I think we can give the panel a round of applause. Just be here and, or you can go, you, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Let me invite now uh, for the closing remarks a comment from a member of Occupy Ghana, a media practitioner and legal practitioner, Samson Ladi Ayenini. He hosts News File on Joy News. Yes. So give us a closing remark. Meanwhile, let me say that uh, we are grateful you joined us for this Constitution Day lecture. Uh, next year, if there's no trouble on January 6, January 7, we may do one. Uh, one what did I say? You said Occupy Ghana. Oh, I said Occupy Ghana. One Ghana movement. Apologies. When you're a journalist, a lot of things run through your head. Forgive me. Thank you very much, Umaru. Uh, my job here is styled as remarks. But I just think that it is fitting to take this opportunity to thank all of you 
starting with Dr. Kujia Farijan, uh, the Honorable Jogate, and Maretta Brew. Please, let's put our hands together once again for them. And thank you all for making the time to come once again, filling this place in full, as you have always done to our lectures. The One Ghana Movement has not been doing only Constitution Day seminars. In fact, our very first project was about adopting a bin. We mobilized money from our pockets and from uh, some donors, and we bought dustbins, the huge ones, call them industrial ones, and placed them at various locations on your streets. We discovered they were being stolen. <laughs> so we decided to find a way to lock them to the ground so that people don't steal them and still people found a way to steal them. We discovered again that we needed extra money to pay for the uh, refuse that was being gathered in those bins. One of our projects has also been what we call honoring the, the pledge. So there's a lot we have done that we continue to do and wish to do. We have actually done a paper on the independent IGP. We have undertaken projects on when there was COVID, on how to sensitize people to make sure that they are you know, living their lives in a way that they will not get COVID, and also for peaceful elections as well. But this appears to be the project that you are very familiar with and we thank you for continuing to patronize this project. We believe that in a country where as much as 6.3 million US dollars is spent to produce a thousand page constitution review document and it is shelved, maybe that money would have, could have been used to get more dustbins to get Accra clean, at least Accra. We also believe that in a country where a president has the discretion to appoint in excess of a hundred and over a dozen ministers, these conversations are important so that we do the right things and not overburden the already impoverished you know, citizens. In a country where you need a hundred million United States dollars to prosecute a successful presidential campaign, the majority leader tells us it's a little less, a little over 50 million US dollars. That's still a lot of money. Where that money is gotten from is important. And we must continue these discussions to ensure we have a good country. If you need to be an MP and you need to find not less than 5 million Ghana cities to prosecute that campaign, we should be interested in where that money comes from and where you will pay back. Yes, those are very important. If the citizens agree, like Dr. Farajan said, that the decentralization must be given the truest meaning by making sure that DCs are elected. And the Constitution has a provision. That provision is Article 243. It needs parliamentary tweaking. It doesn't need a referendum. And the president insists on a referendum on Article 55.3. And when he gathers that the people overwhelmingly will vote against him, he stops the referendum. These conversations are important. So once again, we thank you all so very much for making the time to be here with us. And have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samson Ladia Yanini, and thank you all for being a wonderful audience, and it's been an exciting program. We'll meet again 
next year when we do the next council, we actually have uh, something coming up in March, so that will be communicated uh, when we are ready. Senor, you are sending me an information, I can't see it. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We had invited uh, leadership of the House of Parliament, uh, both sides. Um, unfortunately, they've not been able to make it. The majority leader, who is also Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, has not been able to make it. He sends his apologies, but he has also sent in his stead Mrs. Dorothy Adaziwa Chumesi, who is the aide to that Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, uh, to come and say to us that he has not forgotten about us. I don't know if he's running meetings, but let's leave it. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Uh, we are going to do a group photograph afterwards, uh, so kindly stay behind. The rest of the team will join, and then we'll take photographs. Thank you so much. CTTV has been bringing you this exclusive broadcast, of course, and CTFM with support from other media houses. My name is Umar Rusanda Amadu. Have a good evening, everybody.